Welcome everybody to uh, session one of Dave Zenla. So this is where we have speakers and we have some of the team on. We also have speakers and instructors that are using Zenla or are specialists in their field. So we've got an action packed day today. We've got lots and lots coming on. And the first person I've got on, coming on is Howard. So Howard, if you wanna just pop up, he's waiting for us. And Howard is a charisma coach. He's gonna be running through um, all things to do with presentation through the camera. So he's gonna explain all of this stuff. We've had Howard on before, you know, and if you've been into any of the courses, you've probably seen Howard in there. He did a whole thing. He does this stuff totally free of charge for you guys. Uh, at the end of it, we're gonna put a link up to his page. So if you wanna learn more, you wanna get in contact with Howard, he's always happy to speak to you about all of these things. Good morning, Howard. Good. Good, good afternoon from China, I guess. Good morning in the UK and good night if you're in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're covering a lot of different areas. All right, so I'm going to hand over to Howard and he's going to take you through his presentation. Um, you might want to do a little bit of an intro about yourself, Howard. Entirely up to you. So Howard's going to be on for about an hour. I'm going to feed questions yeah. through that are coming to the chat directly to Howard so he can answer them uh, when they pop up. Lovely. Over to you. Great. Perfect. So thank you so much, uh, David, for that very kind introduction. It's lovely to see everyone again. And um, I've got a little bit of a presentation for you today. So um, this is really about serving, selling and scaling with video, because ultimately, I think that's what we're all looking to do with our video productions. And just a couple of things we're going to spend about an hour together today so the lights camera and intro i'll just give you a broad intro to the world of video and why it's critical we're going to look at preparing for performance and increasing your engagement those are two areas one is thought of a lot engagement and the other the preparation for performance people don't think about quite so much and then Stay to the end, you get a lovely free gift. And then as we say in the movie industry, it's a wrap. So lights, camera, intro, here we go. Why raise the bar on your video? So there has never been a more important time. So 86% of marketers report that video is effective. And this one is staggering to me. On Facebook alone, 100 million hours of videos are watched on Facebook every day. I can hardly believe that statistic myself. So how do you, there you are, stand out from the crowd? And I see so many videos online, which I call the bland, leading the bland. And it's my mission to make people charismatic on camera so that they can stand out there from the millions of hours. Crazy, crazy statistic. And then who the heck is Howard? If you've never met me before, I live in Shanghai, China with Jane, my partner and two cute cats. Uh, I was a semi-professional magician at the age of nine. There's me doing a card trick at not nine. I was 19 there. I became a professional actor at the age of 21 and I've been a global charisma coach since 37. So 24 years, you can work out how old I am. And I've been helping entrepreneurs offline, but it's only recently that I cracked the code on a results-based method that helps people build trust and increase sales online fast. And I want to share some of that with you today. So this is my overall method, and there's nine steps. We won't go through all those steps now, but it's a, all the way from overcoming tech all the way along that roadmap to serving, selling, and scaling. And this area of preparing performance is something many people do not consider. They very much focus on content, engagement, on impact, but they don't necessarily prepare. And often it's because they don't know how. And for those of you who have met me before, you know I'm very much into preparation. And I'm going to be going into some elements of that with you today in a different way, perhaps from before. And then we're going to look at increasing your engagement as well. If we've got time, hopefully we will have. 
So just a warning. I know it's maybe nine o'clock in the morning for you, so you might need a strong coffee <laughs> because some unusual approaches might be suggested when it comes to preparation. So the first thing I'd, I'd love to know from you, and I will be able to see your comments, is what are you currently doing to prepare yourself before you ever switch that camera on? So type in the chat, let us know, what are you doing to prepare before you go on camera? And as those comments come through, I'll be able to be more specific with you about ways of preparing. But I'm going to suggest a few things for you. And the reason for preparation, I love this quote by Benjamin Franklin, by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Pretty simple, really. Preparation is the key. Many people I meet, some of my clients, they might prepare by writing a script. They might spend hours and hours on PowerPoint slides or similar slides. They may do lots of stuff in terms of other preparation. Uh, so David, I know, does a, a voice warm up and lots of water. And that's because he got taught by me. By the way, if you are going to drink water, I have a, a cup here, you can't see me because I'm off camera. Make sure it's room temperature water. Don't drink very cold water because it'll affect your voice badly. Don't drink tea or coffee. So it needs to be room temperature water. So let me know what else you may be doing to prepare. I'm gonna give you a few tips on preparing. Number one is this. I get a lot of tension here in my neck and shoulders. Why? Because I'm an entrepreneur and I spend hours turtling, as they say, on my computer. If I go straight from that turtle, switch on the camera and go into presentation mode, there's a danger that my neck and shoulders will be a bit stiff and tense. And if that's the case, I might look a little bit like a robot. I'm exaggerating here for the purposes of illustration. And what I want to be is very loose and relaxed physically. So I know some of you who have seen me before may have heard about my office chair aerobic. So it's literally a two minute workout for the body, which if you don't know about, reach out to me, I'll be happy to share with you. But the other thing you can do is very gently, simply, massage your neck and your neck muscles by the way I'm, don't worry i'm not stripping off they go all the way down into the between the collarbone and so very very gently again depending on your own personal physiology you might just want to massage gently right down into your neck and then up the sides of the neck and you may want to just gently drop your head and raise it. And when you raise your head, you want to let your mouth open like this. Forgive the seeing up my nose, but there's no real way around that. And then over to one shoulder, over to the other shoulder, and then look behind you and look behind you. And by the way, because our physiology is connected to our emotions and our mind, Physically relaxing has the added benefit of relaxing us emotionally and mentally. So if you're anything like me, you may want to also relax your shoulders a bit. So you can simply raise your shoulders up to your ears. You can do this along with me if you want, because no one can see you. And then just drop them and raise your shoulders up to your ears and drop them. And then you can take your shoulders forward, back to neutral, and back, back to neutral, and down, back to neutral, and then round in a big circle, and round the other way. And just doing that a few times and getting the head and the shoulders loose is just wonderful. And if you're doing this with me, you may already be feeling better. I'm feeling better just showing you. 
The other area we get a lot of tension in, particularly if we're a bit nervous about going on camera, or even, in fact, if we're seasoned entrepreneurs, we can build up a lot of tension in our jaw. And the jawbone meets around here. And you can gently just massage this area. It's great, Pauline, to see that you do a neck and shoulder massage and a stretch and standing, which is wonderful for the vocals. So good on you, Pauline. If you're doing a neck and shoulder massage, that's fantastic. Try your jaw as well, because we carry, you may feel a lot of tension there, it depends. I can feel a fair bit. And here's another one, beware with this one, but one of the muscles we very rarely work out. Can you guess what it might be? It's our, yes, massage for the scalp, always good. It's our tongue. Our tongue is a muscle. And so one of the ways to exercise and to release tension in the tongue, and the reason we're doing this, by the way, is to improve the quality, the crispness of our voice, of the words we enunciate, we simply stick our tongue out. And then as we retract our tongue, we massage it very gently with our teeth. Don't bite your tongue off, please, or New Zendler will be suing me for God knows how much damage is. So this is what it looks like. And if you do it very gently now, you'll feel, I would think, tension in your tongue, and you can use your teeth to massage that tension away. Now, this probably wasn't what you were expecting. I doubt very much whether you've seen this kind of stuff anywhere else. And that's because it comes from the world of professional acting, professional performance. And people get so concerned about the performance side that they forget all this stuff. So good on you, David. Good on you, Pauline. And good on you if you're doing this along with me. If you want and I'm not going to spend too long on this because I could do it for hours, you can extend the tongue and mouth exercise by flicking your tongue against the back of your teeth like this. And if you're clever like me, you can do this and twist your tongue around, and you can do a few tongue twisters. Now, we're not going to, going to have time to go into a vocal warm-up today, but really the voice should come from the diaphragm. Again, if you want some free voice tips, I've got some quick videos for you. Just reach out to me and I'll send those your way. But once you've warmed up your body and your voice, try a couple of tongue twisters. Here's one for you. Unique New York. Unique New York. So the idea of a tongue twister is you start very slowly and you build up the speed, but keep the clarity. And I can do this while I'm setting up my lights and my camera. Unique New York, unique New York, unique New York, unique New York. And that, if we ritualize these, these elements of physical warm up, vocal warm up, getting everything ready, it strengthens our whole preparation for performance. The other massive area of performance is between these two ears here. When I say the word performance, some of you will perhaps be very nervous. Some of you may be very, very competent and already have your set way of doing things. I would like to interrupt that process wherever you are, by suggesting this. When you're getting ready for performance, you forget the performance and you focus on play. Now, play is something that as adults, we rarely do. Maybe we take part in computer games. Maybe you go off and do some role playing stuff. But play is absolutely critical to performance. You cannot have 
a really deep and profound performance where you're delivering spontaneously as I am now without the use of a script and doing it confidently and doing it concisely and doing it consistently, unless you first give yourself permission to play, to mess up, to really explore some zany stuff. And uh, I've encouraged David, who's a great surfer, you may know, you know, on the way to his surf and on the way back from surfing, have a play with his material. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's say, for example, you've got a couple of lines of, of speech of some kind that you would like to deliver in your niche, in, in your subject. Try delivering that in three playfully different ways. I'm going to just take a stereotypical example that I would actually never use, but just to give you an idea of, hi, I'm Howard, the Charisma Coach, and it's wonderful to see you today. So that's me just doing it straight. I can play by doing it as, let's just say, a suspense movie. Hi, I'm Howard, the Charisma Coach. It's wonderful to see you today. <laughs> Fun, right? I could do it as a kind of comedy. Hi, I'm Howard, the Charisma Coach. Wonderful to see you today. And I could do it as a musical. Hello, I'm Howard, the Charisma Coach. It's wonderful to see you here today. Now, you may be thinking, oh, my God, this guy's lost his marbles. Why is he suggesting I do these zany things? They're never going to work in performance. So what I'd like you to do is take that voice that critic's voice that's absolutely essential because it's designed to protect you from embarrassment, from making horrible mistakes. And to just say to that voice, step aside for a moment. I'm just going to stop sharing because I think this is kind of critical. Step aside for a moment, Mr. Critic, Mrs. Critic, or even give it a name, Jimbo, even give it a picture. Say, go and have a nice cup of tea. We just want to have a play and worry not because later you can come back in and you can be as absolutely critical and help us out with that side of things. So this separation between play and performance, I first learned as a creative writer, in fact, through a wonderful book. I believe it's called Becoming a Writer by Dorothea Brand. And it, although it was written in the 1950s, it has a wonderfully fresh tone. And it was before all those other artists' way type books came along. And it's really about this separation of the creative, playful self who just has a love, in that case of words, in this case, a love of firing those words into the camera in different ways. And then taking a break having a clear demarcation, and then inviting the critic back in. Now, the critical thing about inviting the critic back in is that we don't want that critic to start going, oh, Howard, you're going a bit bald, mate. Hey, you've got a bit of fat under the chin. You've got wrinkles. You're obviously 61, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean, that overly critical voice. We want to give the critic a focus. So we say to our critic, watch back this video of me singing and doing it as a comedy and doing it as a suspense. And can you see Mr. Critic or Jimmy, whoever it is, can you see one or two things that I could perhaps surprisingly use in my actual presentation. So I'll give you an example. It, it may not be that I go, hi, I'm Howard, the charisma coach, you know, in this dark and desperate way, but I might just go with a touch of that energy. Hi, I'm Howard, the charisma coach. So the principle here is you release the critic, go and take a break, Mr. Critic, Mrs. Critic, Ms. Critic. 
you play in all different ways and there are many many great books on play and creativity but you play let's say just with style you record it you have a break you allow the critic back in and then you look for areas that you feel could, if they were toned down and restrained and brought within your professional compass, be used in performance. So I hope that's helpful to you just in terms of the preparation alone. And I do know this, if you are an experienced performer, it's going to be harder for you to do this than if you're brand new, because if you're brand new, you're like, well, Howard, I'm open to anything, my friend, because I'm terrified of the camera. Please, what can you do to help? If you're experienced, and I deal with people who have tens of thousands of followers on, on YouTube, hundreds of thousands of views who have done video after video, and they've hammered it, and they've practiced till it hurts. And the problem with that is that practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And so it will be harder for you to break the mold and do some of this stuff than if you had no experience. But I just strongly suggest that you get a ritual in place that takes care of the physical side. It takes care of the vocal side and it allows you to play with your material in ways that you never have before. I give you full permission to mess up in rehearsal so we can get it right in performance. So I hope that's helpful to you just on the preparation side of things. And now just go, go get my Canva back again and we shall press on. One second. By the way, if you've got any comments on any of this, do just um, let me know in the in the chat. David is very kindly fielding that chat through to me using all kinds of technical layers that I know absolutely nothing about. I'm not a highly technical person. And usually things I don't want to jinx anything, but usually things go wrong. And when they go wrong, that playful self is able to dance with my material because I'm able precisely to play. So, Chris, just to answer your comment, lovely to see you here, by the way, Chris. Chris is a fantastic guy for all things to do with geometry. And oh, my God, join his Facebook group if you're not part of it. That's what I'm saying. This idea of play as preparation think of it as a sacred space chris think of it as i whatever happens no matter how good this video is or how bad it is i'm simply going to play the line and i give myself full permission to go over the top be exaggerated i know i will never show this to anyone else but what we're doing ultimately is we're mining for gold and you can never find the gold unless you dig hard. If you do a little bit of digging and then think, oh, I've had enough of that stupid thing, you're never going to find gold. But if you dig deep and you bring out sides of yourself, Chris, and everyone else who likes this idea, bring sides of yourself into that play space that you would never normally bring onto a Facebook Live or into a, a course creation video or whatever it is, a marketing video, a sales video, then you may be surprised when you play it back and think, actually, that tone, if I bring it down and restrain it, I could use an element of that. You never would have found the gold unless you dug through the mud. Most people are bland on camera because they unconsciously develop a method over the years. What I'm asking you to do in that play space, Chris, is to consciously let those restraints off. Give them a break. Let them go have a holiday for 
uh, uh, 10 minutes or so and then invite them back. It's very important that we keep our critical faculties. We don't want to just come on camera wild and undisciplined. We want to be structured, but we want to have been wild and undisciplined in order to move towards structure. So I hope that that makes sense to you. I did warn you that unusual methods would be suggested. So on we go. Um, are there any questions about that physical side, vocal side, or this play side before I move on to the second part? No questions yet, oh. Howard. All right, well, no worries. Let Chris, me press Chris on. is loving the you know players' preparation, and I, I was like yeah. saying that um, you know that's the problem. Like self critique is always like holding us back, isn't it? It can, it can. And I, I think one of the things that makes for a stellar performer is someone who has learned that that critical voice has its place, it has its value, but it's not overarching. It's not like the monkey on our back going, you can't do that. No, no one will like, why are you talking about having breakfast? Nobody, blah, 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 whatever it is. And it never allows us freedom if we allow it to be very severe. And I know, David, because I have suffered in the past from very severe self-criticism. You know, I was saying things to myself that I never would dream of saying to anyone else. So I'm not sure where your guys are at in the new Zendler journey of growth. Um, I would argue, though, that most of us are probably too self-critical and not free enough. But that's just a lot to do with our education system, I think. Let's move on. So engagement is another huge area that people tell me they want to improve. Here's a great quote by a chap called Howard. Failure to engage is a failure to build trust. That may be a slightly different way of looking at engagement. People tend to see engagement as a sign of interest, as a sign that they've captured something that is of relevance. In my world, it's when you begin to trust me, Howard, and you feel it's safe to engage, that you know, you're not going to get trampled on. There's no such thing as a bad question, as it were. All that stuff that gets established, then you engage with the material. So what videos get the most engagement? Surprise, surprise, if you don't know this, short form wins, and it wins massively. But 61% of marketers consider video engagement the top metric of success and one to four minute videos get 71 to 72 percent engagement however short form videos are the hardest type of video to make for those of you who love poetry a haiku which is 17 syllables looks deceptively easy but it's the hardest poem to write. It's much easier to write a Longfellow epic, in fact, although it may seem harder. So it's easier for me to do this one hour presentation now than to get on my phone and do a three minute live into TikTok or Reels. And people think of it the other way around often. I don't know what your thinking is around it. But here are some tips to increase your engagement. Can anyone guess, I'll send you, I'll send you, if you can guess this, a free ebook. I interviewed 17 global experts on public speaking. That ebook's on Kindle. I think it's about 9 99 I'll send it to you for free. David will sort it out somehow, no idea. If you can guess the number one way to increase your engagement, I'm going to give you... 15 seconds because, you know, I don't want to hold things up if, if everyone's still half asleep or if I haven't yet built enough trust to get engagement from you. But if you can guess what I believe, so you're going to have to read my mind, what I believe is the number one way to increase your engagement. I'm going to have a sip of room temperature water.
being on camera. Well, yeah, you can't get engagement without being on camera. It's a great guess. It's almost right, in fact, almost. Post a video in the first place. Yes, you can't get engagement unless you actually post. <laughs> but unfortunately, of those 100 million hours a day watched, lots of those videos are pants. Lots of those videos are the bland leading the bland. That's not you, of course. No. It's those other guys. And I, I will be merciless. You know, I'll look, see a video more than three minutes and it's somebody scrambling their eggs in their kitchen and I'm gone. So we're very ruthless these days in our video watching. So here's, here's the answer in my world. Number one way to get engagement with others is to be engaged with yourself and even more important, perhaps, or at least as important, be engaged with your material. You may be able to tell I am 300% mission oriented. I am on a mission to make a million people charismatic on camera. Confidence on camera is no longer good enough. There's plenty of people who are confident. It's the bland leading the bland. Charisma, really standing out from the crowd, being strong. There's nothing that gets more engagement. Why? We have watched thousands and thousands of hours of movies, the top movies on the planet from Hollywood, from superstar actors, all the way through to little videos of cats and kids playing. We know authentic passion, real dedication, absolute expertise, brimming with confidence, brimming with wisdom, whatever it is that you want to bring to your tribe, your audience, if you bring it with every ounce of you, with every bit of sincerity, and you take risks with that material, you don't script it, but you follow a very precise route, you will get great engagement. So if you're writing notes, write it down. Be engaged with myself. Be engaged with my material. If you're not, it won't read. So Kevin, you just asked, what's the maximum length for a short form video? I'm going to be super harsh here. I think anything over three minutes, you're in trouble. There's a clear drop off point from the three minute mark, even up to four minutes, you could perhaps get away with. Certainly, it should never be longer than four minutes. But I would say, Kevin, aim for three. And that means you have to have absolute precision, absolute precision. The other great way to get engagement is this. Think of one of your presentations, one of your videos right now, just take a moment to think of a video you're not perhaps happy with, or that's lying in a digital vault somewhere because you've never dared to publish it, or you did publish it, but it met with crickets, but you kind of like the subject. Go back to it and ask yourself this critical question. What critical question can I begin that video with? And when I say critical question, it can be a question that is contentious. I'm saying to you, confidence on camera is not enough. Now, that's a contentious statement. Plenty of people think, I wish I were confident on camera, but in my world, no. So I could start a video by saying, if you're confident on camera, you're failing. Or I could say, do you believe that being confident on camera is enough? Or I might say, do you think 
that confidence and camera skills are all you need to make a great video. So play around with different questions right out of the gate. There's no, hi, I'm Howard, I'm the Charisma Coach. It's a question. Here's another way to get fantastic engagement. And I would like you to get a piece of paper if you're still oldie worldy, old school, to write this down. Or if you're using a word processing document or something digital, then type it. Are you ready? To get engagement, ask your people to write something down. Uh, I'm evil, David, I know, I look innocent, but I'm nasty, really. So here's the thing, all the research is in. If we write something down, we begin to own it. We begin to engage with that material. And that is why on, if you watch sales videos, you will see so many of those sales presenters saying, write in the chat, where are you from? Put yes if you like this. Put no if you want that. Put maybe if you want this. They are asking you to write because they know that when you write, you own. And when you own, you begin to engage with the material. Right now, by writing down, write things down and get my audience to write things down, even though you know this is a technique now, as it were, you still will own that material more than if you're just simply sitting, having a cup of tea, thinking, who the heck is Howard? It's a different level of engagement. It's a quantum leap. And it's genetically and culturally embedded so deep within us. Think of it this way. How old were you when you learned how to write? So there's a part of that deep child in you that is engaged when you pick up the pen or even when you type words and you see words, you begin to engage. And then I'm going to give you a tip from a very good friend of mine called Andrew Stotts, who's one of the people I interview in my in my book, Own the Room. Bit of a plug. Did you see that? And um, what he does is he gets a thousand people in a room or whatever it is in a Zoom room. And before he begins, he insists that everybody type a question. And this is how he does it. I want to share this with you because I think it's great if you've got the cojones for it. <laughs> he says, I'm not going to begin until I get 10 fantastic questions into this chat. You came on this call for a reason. You have a question in your mind that you want me to answer. I'm not going to go through a generic presentation just on the grounds that maybe I'll hit, maybe I'll miss. I'm going to adapt my presentation to your questions. And he will literally hammer people <laughs> in only the way Andrew can for 10 minutes. I kid you not until he gets those questions. But the beautiful thing about that is that once he has those questions, his software allows people to upvote questions. So he's actually gaining market intelligence as he presents. And then if let's say he covers three out of those 10 questions, he's then got a reason to go back to his audience afterwards to say, we didn't have time to answer your questions on this call. I'm going to make a video for you to answer the remaining seven questions. And if you'd like to receive that, give me your email or whatever it is that he wants to do to build his client base. So I offer that to you as a suggestion for improving engagement. So, Chris, you bring up a very good point. You can't see or read the audience. What you can see and read, as I alluded to at the beginning, is yourself. I'm fully engaged with my material. 
one of the ways that I can test engagement, it's more difficult in a Facebook Live because there's about a 25 to 30 second gap between when I ask you to type something and when you actually type it, is to ask people to type things, to write in, to contribute to the chat. Ask people if you're in a Zoom meeting to get on camera right from the get-go to introduce themselves, to tell you what they're looking for. So right from the very beginning, you're fully engaged. And then again, it depends on your technology, but you want to break things up. So if I were on a Zoom now, what I'd love to do is to put you into breakout rooms where each of you now discusses ways that you engage or challenges you have around engagement and then agree that something you're going to implement from that discussion or from what I've given you, because it's the implementation that helps you to grow. I want you to be engaged, Chris, and I can see you are because you've written a great question, but I also want you to implement. So I would say to you this, Chris, my friend, even though I can't see you, choose any one of the tips I've given you on engagement and choose to implement that in your very next presentation. And then we're connected already. Reach out to me and let me know how it went. So engagement is short term, medium term and long term, a bit like investing in the stock market. You, you can't invest in engagement short term. I've had people who kindly watched my new Zenla marketing, you know, months ago, it was probably about a year ago, I'm not very good with time, who are only now reaching out to work with me. They've kind of decided, actually, Howard's an OK guy. <laughs> and so that engagement, Chris, has gone slowly over a period of time. And they've watched my Facebook videos. They've attended a workshop. They may have done a number of other things in order to check me out first. And you may find that the same thing happens to you. So it's disconcerting for us because we cannot see people's faces and we're deeply programmed aren't we to read reactions through expression through micro movements through tiny little gestures i have to compensate for that so here's another thing i can do and you can do chris and you may have heard me say this before but i think it's worth repeating do you remember those old days when we used to have voicemail on these things? You know, you'd phone somebody up and it would go through to voicemail. It doesn't happen very often now. And then you'd say, hi, it's Howard. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just calling you because I wanted to tell you about my latest widget. Uh, it, I think it'll be really great for you. So I'll give you a call back when you're free. And I'm going uh, uh, because it's disconcerting when there's no response Normally, we're used to not sitting as I am now in my office talking at a camera for an hour. <laughs> we're used to having a dialogue, a back and forth. So how can you compensate for that feeling of absence on the other side of the camera? It's this. You may have heard people say, imagine a, you're talking to a friend. And I think that's fabulous advice. I would say more precisely this, imagine you are speaking to somebody who gets you, who gets it. I'm not persuading you to have charisma on camera. You know how important it is, right? So that takes away some danger of cajoling people or haranguing them or trying to convince and, and push because they get you. And the other little trick, if you're visual, this works very well. If you're not, it may not. Picture the person's face in there, in that camera lens. And they're not just stationary, but I'll say something and then they'll smile and nod back. So here's how it might go. I'm going to tell you about charisma. They're going in the camera. <laughs> and by doing that, 
I fill in some of those awkward gaps, it also allows me to do this. To be comfortable with slowing down and to be comfortable with silence. And there's nothing more engaging than a judicious use of pace, slowing it down and making something quietly or loudly emphatic, depending on your personality. So I hope those tips help you. Number one, be engaged with yourself and equally or more important, be engaged with your material. Number two, think of some killer questions right out of the gate to begin with that absolutely go to your avatar's pain point or, or particular concern or particular desire for growth and transformation. Number three, I've forgotten what it is now because I'm not using a script. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so it's get people to write things down. That was it. And then number four is fill in the gaps. And I think I may have given you another couple of bonus ones in there as well. So I hope that was useful. Time is, goes incredibly quickly with these things. We're almost done. But does anyone else have any questions or feedback about either of these huge subjects, the preparation you do before you get on camera, or how to improve or increase your engagement, anything at all, now is your moment to ask me before we wrap up. Hi, Howard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question. There's no more questions coming to into the chat at this point in time, but there will be. No By the way, Howard will monitor this, and if there are any questions coming, he will feed back to you. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah the, going back to the sort of uh, short form videos, um, yeah, I think you're spot on there with the one to sort of three minute ratio. Uh, and in fact, guys, you know, if you look at something like TikTok or Instagram, their max time for short videos is three minutes. And there's a reason that they do that. So that's exactly why Howard was pointing out um, that point to you. I think also Correct. it's like. How, I mean, the other thing is like people will ask the question, like how do, when they don't see, like Chris asked, like how they don't see people on camera, how do you get that? Um, how do you know you've got that engagement? Personally, I use like lots of times, if you haven't got people on camera, you look at the participation numbers and you see if they drop out, but that's an analytical way of looking at it. How do you look at it, Howard? I try to bring the maximum amount of genuine value in the minimum amount of time with the minimum amount of waffle and give people absolute value that I know works. And then I let go of the result. So when I was very first coaching in the real world, the offline world, some 34 years ago, I was quite nervous. It was the very first time I was going to coach some salespeople. And the VP of, of international sales, an American guy, a wonderful guy, came over to me at the beginning and he said, Howard, remember this through the rest of your coaching career. No matter how good you get, you're never going to be able to take everyone with you. So don't even try. I think it's when we try, if I said to you, you know, please ask a question, you know, I feel lonely here in my little place in Shanghai. I'm kind of exaggerating, David, but you know what I mean. And the fact that there are not questions or there are questions, you know, or there are participants leaving, if any of that concerns us, it detracts from the value that we're giving to the people who are with us, who are benefiting. I know that this will not be of benefit to all of you. I wish it could be, but I learned 34 years ago that it's impossible to take everyone with me. The only people I'm going to take with me are the people who value my material. And ultimately, in fact, for you, David, for you, Chris, for you, Kevin, we only really want to take the people with us who we want to serve. 
I don't want to have a client who's kicking and screaming and going, oh, that plaything, that's rubbish, mate. I'm, I'm not good. No, I want someone who goes, wow, play. What a great idea. I never thought of playing on camera. That I'm going to give it a try. So I'm only really interested ultimately is where does my value match my market? And as long as I've done my due diligence, which is to closely question my market, to understand their needs, to understand their desires, I know people want more engagement on camera. And I know that they do not generally consider preparation. So in this hour, I've tried to give you maximum value on those two subjects. And then I let go of the result. It doesn't matter to me if you are engaged or not. Ultimately, what counts is for those of you who are engaged, if it's been valuable and you've picked up one more tool that you can put in the toolbox, hey, we're a step closer to charisma. And that brings me to Kevin's question. How do you start to gain more charisma? You do it by paradoxically, Kevin, not focusing on charisma at all. So I am a nasty chap. David knows this. I look nice, but I'm not. I'm tricksy. So here's the thing. Think of charisma like a beautiful rose. A gardener doesn't try to focus on producing a beautiful rose. The gardener prepares the soil. The gardener buys top quality seeds and places them in a location which has the maximum opportunity for growth, for sunlight, for the, the wind factors. The gardener will train that rose up against a fence or not train it. it that gardener might mix the seeds to get a different genetic mix. And then having got all those pre preparations correct, God the universe, spirit, genetics, whatever you want to call it, produces the beautiful rose of charisma. So in fact, Kevin, if you focus on really preparing yourself so you're physically limbered up, you do some of these engagement exercises and you will need more. I, I know you probably hear this a lot, but in one hour, I can't give you four decades of experience. I would argue that you could learn to be charismatic on camera in three months to a year, depending on where you currently are at. But it needs to be worked at. Creativity is a muscle that needs to be worked. It's a seed that needs to be planted and watered. The way we shape our content and structure our three minute TikTok videos above all is critical to allow the flower of charisma to come out and shine. So I have done a lot of hard work of blood, sweat and tears. I am not focused on my charisma. You know, I'm a, I'm a bit like a British version of Woody Allen. I do lots of gesturing stuff. That's me. You may be much quieter, more controlled, more, or you may be more aggressive and more full on. <laughs> but whatever you are, I would argue that can be enhanced, changed, shifted considerably. We tend to think of ourselves as set, but we're not. I've changed massively since the age of 19, not just in terms of the natural aging process, but through deliberate exercises that stretch the self and pull it into areas and corners that perhaps I was scared of going at some points and that were possibly dangerous in other points. Now, I'm never going to ask anyone to do that. But what I've done is I've distilled those lessons and put them into my own particular method. So I would say, of course, I would, Kevin, you know, work with a charisma coach. Do you know anybody? <laughs> um, you know, the problem with looking at charismatic people and we all know who those are, the absolute megaliths, the superstars, is you're seeing the rose. You know, someone like Tony Robbins, John Asraf, whoever it is that you admire, I admire both of them for their, for their presentation skills. Guess what? They've worked with coaches intensively. You don't come out of the womb charismatic. And it's something that 
really most of us have to work on consciously. So if you make play conscious, if you make preparation conscious, if you make engagement techniques conscious, it will help you to relax more in the presentation, bring your full self to the presentation. So I hope that helps. So let's wrap up. Um, there is a free gift that uh, I believe David is going to um, tell you about. It's a three-step guide and it's a hybrid workbook ebook. It's somewhat related to some of this that we've been talking about and also has some different stuff. And it is also entirely free of charge, which is nice. And that's the overall pattern I work to, just as a reminder of how I got to be charismatic. And then really, that's it. As we say in the movie, it's a wrap. So back over to you, David. That's, uh, that's brilliant, uh, Howard. So yeah, as Howard mentioned there, um, all, all of our speakers come on and they dedicate free time telling you about their, their subjects, which they are obviously selling. And so Howard's come on, he's come on a few times. He's actually done a bit of a course uh, with us on the tutorial site. He's also been on the David Zeller before, um, and he's come on again because, you know, he's an expert in his area. So it is, it is I actually went through a bit of a program with Howard and it's helped me a tremendous amount. And it's amazing. Like you just have to work on these things. It is hard, but I think it's like anything in life. The more you do it, the better you get. So you just carry on and you go through. And I think that uh, the whole word charisma is really associated with making a connection with the people that are viewing you. Um, that connection in itself causes um, the charisma to happen because they're following you. We've all got our super fans. You know, Mammy's got hers, Liz, Alice, Kevin, me. We've got our people that follow us because they love how we teach and how we do things. And that's going to be different from person to person. So this subject is such a big one. It's amazing because, as we know, video is the highest conversion that you can do online. So if you're producing any kind of videos, then having some of these skills and they, you know, maybe you think you're OK, but it's worth getting assessed. Like, what are you doing? Sending a clip and having it assessed and like, oh, I didn't even realize I was doing that, especially th things like ums and ahs, which I was terrible i still do them and sometimes that's kind of a natural thing but having a little bit of coaching like how can you avoid that how can you cut it down it's something i always have to think about all the time but if i do think about it and i concentrate i can eliminate all the ums and ahs in content that i'm doing it will never stop completely because sometimes it's a lead on but it's a really good thing to learn these tips these little things that you put in a tool bag that you can go oh i'm doing that so i need to just pull that little tool out that i learned from howard or similar coaches and it's so powerful it's really powerful uh, for sure so i'm going to quickly show up the um site uh, that i've put actually into the chat where howard is actually offering a freebie and here is the page here so you can go in here and you can sign up and you can grab this freebie. Of course, you know, if you want to just talk, if you don't want to put your name and email in there, you can always just directly contact Howard and he's always happy to talk to you firsthand or even send you. He was talking about a free gift that he was going to send you through. Nobody guessed it. So no one's getting it. So the only way you'll get it is to talk to Howard. <laughs> and that way, so that right. way you've got it. So absolute yeah, no, pleasure to have no you. No pressure on. there. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it's wonderful. And I will say this for those of you who know David, one of the things I love about David and I love about working with entrepreneurs like David is he's so open spirited and open to learning. And I don't know about you, but I love learning. When I'm learning, I'm growing. And when I'm growing, I'm evolving. And there's nothing more fulfilling, really, I think, in our nature than feeling we're evolving. So I hope today has helped you to evolve a little bit. And it's such a pleasure to see you again, David. You're doing such a wonderful job flying the new Zenla flag 
I couldn't say no when you said, Howard, would you come back for a rematch? You know. <laughs> Part two. Yeah, part two. And of course, we had part Kevin two. on as well. And Kevin's fabulous uh, on camera yeah. anyway. So he's putting some of those questions in there. Uh, you know, he does all he hosts all the challenges. He's been doing this stuff for a long time on camera yeah. in front of public speaking. And look, he's still asking questions like how do you get these sort of things? You know, what should you? So he asked questions. I think everybody, all the Zen the team, we're always wanting to learn. And what's so good about it is it's not just you learning from us. We teach you how to use a platform and, you know, you ask for specific things, but we also learn from you. You know, we ask you questions. I might reach out to someone and ask them a question I have. I have done that with Howard and Howard's taken me through quite an intensive uh, training over a few month period while yeah. I was having to send all these videos and thinking, Oh, what am I doing now? I was having to pull all these faces and do all this stuff, you know? but there was a reason behind it. And it, it was to get comfortable on camera and, and not mind like put like someone wouldn't like pull a funny face on camera. I don't mind doing that now because I feel comfortable to do that. I wouldn't have done that before. You know, these are massive things. And, and I guess because of Howard's uh, acting background, he's used to doing all sorts of roles and like acting crazy. Some of the things that we were we were doing was, was just hilarious. You know, it was Howard was doing <laughs> each word and all, all sorts of funny things. It's I brilliant. think that's a good point. That's a good point to end with is whatever else you take away from this today is have fun. We tend to take ourselves very seriously sometimes. Have a bit of fun. No one, if people don't like you having fun, do you want to work with those people? <laughs> I don't think so. So, you know, have a bit of fun, lighten up, enjoy your time on camera, and people will have fun with you. Lovely. Thank you, Howard. I've got Liz waiting. She just popped up. <laughs> she'll be she's coming next so thank you so much howard um i'll speak to My you soon pleasure. I, uh, absolute pleasure to have you on uh, brilliant Likewise. as usual i always know it's <laughs> going to be a real pro presentation when you come on it's super uh, it's my pleasure take care and enjoy the rest of your day everybody thank you howard bye hello now i have liz there, we, there she is there you are Hello, hello. hello. <laughs> so, for some reason, my background is not working. Oh, it's um, green. It's okay. It's all right. It's yeah. nice and clean. You've got your, you've got your famous, Lizzie's famous whiteboard. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I had to run upstairs and grab it quick before I came on. Um, but yeah. I thought I ha have to have the whiteboard, don't I? You do, you do, yeah. It's uh, yeah. I've been told, I've been told by Rakesh that I need to get a whiteboard. I said I don't do whiteboards. I'll do, <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do something else. I'll just point to something on the screen. That's what I do. So I'm going to be doing something soon. All right, look, I'm going to hand you over to Liz. Liz has got a really exciting. I'm going to let Liz talk about it today, but it's a really exciting subject, and she's ready to rock and roll. So Liz, over to you. I'll speak to you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. And it follows on really, really nicely, actually, um, from the presentation you just had on Charisma. So what I'm sharing with you today is the importance of communication. And of course, you know, underneath that charisma is communication. And what is communication for you? I would love it if you could drop into the chat um, what communication is for you. And to just make sure that I can see what your answers are. Okay, so I have a little bit of a delay here. <laughs> and that's all part of the fun. That's all part of the fun and the connection and the communication when you're working live with people. And I think speaking about communication, when you're doing a presentation like this, I'm just speaking into a camera, so I can't actually sort of see you, you know, person to person. And for me, I much prefer it when it's like a live situation, like the live classes, and then I can actually see your faces as well. Because when we're communicating, we've got 55% of our communication is body language. 
another 38% of that communication is tone. And then only 7% of communication is actually the words that we are speaking. Okay, so here we go. So we have some in here, Liz. Uh, oh, amazing. Thank you, David. <laughs> Chris, Chris put a connection, making a connection with people. Um, I've put offering value and engagement. Uh, Mammy, it's also put understanding without explanation. Ooh, I love it. Thank you. And thank you so much, David, for popping in. It's I finally caught up on the Facebook, but thank you so much for your support. And again, that's connection. That's communication. So communication is definitely connection. And I think, you know, it's often said that the key to any relationship is communication. And from a sort of a leadership and an LP background, you know, the communication, the very last communication you've had with someone is the value of that relationship, because the relationship is only whatever the relationship is within that moment. So if you lose communication, you lose that connection with somebody, perhaps with friends, with family, with your audience, with your potential audience, in that moment, there isn't a relationship there in that second. There's obviously a historical relationship and there's a relationship you can pick up, but that connection, that communication is so, so important throughout all your relationships across your life. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. It is um, connection. Absolutely. It's offering value because when you're communicating, you're giving something, you're sharing something if you're the one that's speaking. If, however, you're on the other side and you're listening to somebody communicating, then your communication part in that balance and that balanced relationship of that moment is going to be the listener. So when we're thinking about different types of communication, and as Mammy said, understanding without explanation, communication for me is about clarity and connection. So it's about understanding what the other person is communicating to you and them understanding what you're communicating with them. And very often when we're communicating, we may be listening to somebody, but we may already be preempting what we're about to reply. And the problem is that when you find yourself doing that, you find that you're not actually actively listening to everything that person is saying. You're perhaps picking up, you know, a small percentage of that conversation or it could be you know obviously some people aren't speaking so they are going to be communicating with body language communicating with sign language can even be communicating you know just through picture through drawing so i've got my lovely whiteboard here and the reason i use that is that when we're communicating people enjoy connection through different areas through different senses because all of the data that we're taking in at any moment we're absorbing it in through all of our senses so for a really really good communication a really good connection with people it's really handy to put in as many of those different senses as possible so right now you've got visual you can see me here you can hear me so you've got the audio and then you're also hopefully going to be feeling something as i'm speaking and that can be anything so as i'm speaking it may trigger some old memories for you it may trigger a previous presentation you've enjoyed um, with me or with a day with zenla And even there within that silence, we were still communicating. So you could still see what I was doing. You couldn't hear while I was coughing, but you could see me. So the communication and that connection still continues even when you're not speaking. So how do you get to be a really good communicator? Well, the first thing is to connect and communicate with yourself. So this is where I love for people to begin. Okay, hopefully you can hear me okay. Just let me know if there's any issues. 
um, with the with the delay. Ah, but I'm so saying that this is a beautiful connection and that you can see and hear me well. And again, with live um, streaming like this, you can get delays of connection. So sometimes the visual is out of sync from our audio. And when that happens, it gives us a really interesting connection. It gives us an interesting communication because what we're seeing and what we're hearing are not aligned. They're not moving together. And when that happens, it can be really confusing for us and it can be a bit disorientating. So when that's happening, I like to suggest that if it's something that you don't need to be looking at immediately in that moment, you can just close your eyes and really focus on the sound. So for any of you watching live, for any of you watching on the replay, thank you for being here. And just for a moment, just close your eyes and notice what changes for you. Are you more aware of the sound? Is it the same? Perhaps you are primarily a visual person and you prefer to see the person that's speaking. So just notice what changes when you take away that visual and you're concentrating purely on the audio. And they, these are, I'm going to have a couple of little tiny exercises like that throughout the session. And it's just to get you to really begin to connect and communicate with yourself first. Because it's the same as everything. When we have a good relationship, a good connection with ourselves, we're able to have a good connection and a good relationship, a good communication with everybody else around us as well. So another quick exercise um, that I'm going to ask for you to do right now, if you choose to do so, is to just close your eyes and ask yourself this really simple question. See, so when you're ready, as long as it's safe to close your eyes, absolutely come back to this if you're driving or anything, but just close your eyes and just ask yourself, how do I feel? Amazing. And acknowledge whatever's come up for you. Thank yourself for whatever you noticed. You may have noticed um, a word. It may have been a feeling. You may have seen a picture. You may have heard something. Or indeed, maybe nothing came up at all. Because maybe right now you're not quite sure how you're feeling. And that's equally absolutely fine. And by taking that little exercise, and I like to really um, suggest that people give that a try every day. First of all, it's going to help your own self-connection, your own self-awareness, but it's also really going to improve your communication skills because you're taking time to ask yourself a question. You're then taking the time to quietly and calmly actually listen to what that answer is. And it's a brilliant way to begin to up-level your communication with other people. Because one of the top skills of a great communicator is being able to actively listen. And by actively listen, it's not just hearing what the words are. It's hearing the words, but it's also taking into account the whole holistic experience. So everything else that that person is giving you. Because remember, your body language, that is... 55% of the communication that you are receiving. Um, and obviously it's plus or minus a few percent here and there, but this is roughly speaking um, how it is. And then you've got the tone and that is 38% of the communication that you're receiving. And then you've got the words. So the words are only 7% of that communication that you're receiving. So what you may have noticed is when you closed your eyes and you were just listening to what I was saying, there's less information that you're actually receiving because you can't see me anymore. But you could still hear the words and you could still hear the tone. Now, if I was to speak just in kind of like a very straight, 
constant way, it's much more difficult for you to actually get a feeling of how I'm feeling with the information that I'm sharing with you. Whereas when I'm speaking normally, my tone changes a lot. And especially if you, you know, enjoyed the meditation things, it gets really, really calm. And that encourages you to also become, but then if I'm getting really, really excited, then my tone is completely different. And see, that's going to get you into a much more motivated frame of mind. So the tone really is a massive, massive part of communication. And it's something to practice with again. So what I'd love for you to do right now is just take, um, actually, you could take these words up here because this will just be putting that these thoughts into the back of your mind, into your unconscious mind for you. And this will support you going forwards with all your future communications and connections. So I'd love for you to just say out loud um, to yourself, body language, 55%, and just do it in a really calm tone. Body language, 55%. Shall I, shall I do this? Yeah, go ahead. I love a volunteer. <laughs> yeah, I'll be a volunteer. I'll be a guinea pig. Body language, 55 Beautiful. And then if you can say tone, 38% in a really excited, motivated tone. Tone, 38%. I love it. And then we're going to go, whew, what could we go for words? Word 7%. I'm going to let you pick and then I'm going to guess what tone you are using. Words 7%. Oh, sad. A bit tired, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> words 7%. <Yes. laughs> excited happy amazing and so you notice you know and with that the tone and you even added in that extra body language as well because you're really raising it and with the body language that's another really interesting thing when you're looking to sound motivated and you're looking to sound excited then if you're raising your arms above your waist especially above your head then it really adds in to that excitement to that inviting people into your speaking and if you're speaking and you want to be communicating something really calmly to have your hands actually lower definitely under waist height will naturally calm how you're speaking and it will naturally be calming whoever you're speaking with and that's a really handy communication tip for if you're dealing with perhaps you know a slightly challenging person that you're communicating with and it's also really handy to remember that with your hands handy with your hands to keep them below your waist if you're speaking and you feel that there there may be some form of resilience there may be some hesitation some resistance with the other person that you're communicating with and so the calmer that you can speak the easier that connection, that communication is going to go. And in that same frame of mind with the body language, when you're communicating with someone, if you can actually be matching their body language, then that's going to improve the connection that you have with them in that moment. And I don't mean be like a complete mirror image of somebody because that's going to look really strange. They may think that you're mocking them. They may, you know, think that you're just having a bit of a joke at their expense. But by mirroring perhaps the tone of their voice, you can begin to improve that connection and really build up, um, it's described as rapport. So by matching the tone that the other person is speaking at, or even the speed that they're speaking at, that can begin to create a good connection and can really improve your communication. And if someone's, you know, a bit stressed and you're there to help support them, to calm them down, again, move your hands down, but also begin to, you know, match their rate of their, their pace of speech to begin with, and then begin to slow yours down. And what you'll find is that they'll actually follow you. And it may take a little while, it depends how 
um, how much of rapport you've actually got going with them, how good your connection and your communication with them is in that moment. But when you try that, you really will notice that you begin to diffuse the situation and just calm everything down so that you can then move forward with whatever the conversation was about in the first place, or you can leave it, come back to it later but in a gentle frame of mind rather than someone getting so stressed that they then just you know exit the situation and with that mirroring if anybody has got a young baby um this just came to mind so i'm going to share it here because again it's another communication and it's a non-verbal one because obviously a newborn baby doesn't understand the words that we're speaking yet so and this works with animals as well so again, it's where that communication is not verbal and it's much more instinctual, much more natural. So what you get to do is if the baby is crying or if the animal is um, you know, distressed, as long as this is safe to do so, um, especially with the animal, let's say with the baby, but you can just lie next to them and you can match their rate of breathing. Now, if they're upset, if they're in distress, then it's going to be a much, you know, more rapid breathing. But if you begin to match theirs, and then if you gently slow your breathing rate down, it's going to naturally calm them. And it may take a little while. Again, it's going to depend on how good that connection is in that moment. And remember these connections, it's not the value of it overall. It's just in that moment, the value of that connection, that communication in that moment. And obviously that changes second to second because everything around us is changing all the time and we're changing all the time. So our emotions, our behaviors are constantly in flow. But if you take that time just to match their breathing, to then slow down your breathing, then you will find that there is a lovely calmness and the situation will calm the baby, the animal, they may well fall asleep because you've got that beautiful connection, that nice connected communication. And it's a safety. And also, if you can add in that, you know, I've mentioned about the body language, but you've also got touch. So touch is another way to communicate. And especially, you know, if you go back, you know, like hundreds of years, thousands of years, yeah, hundreds of years, thousands, um, then we used to be far more tactile with each other. In society at the moment, it's very different. And especially, you know, with the last few years that we've had, you know, we weren't allowed to physically sort of connect and hug other people. Fortunately, that has changed now. And, and we can do but just by having that physical touch as well that can support with your connection with your communication and obviously it's appropriate so for example if you've just met somebody for the first time you probably wouldn't necessarily go and jump into a great big hug so it's always appropriate connection appropriate communication again within that moment and that's going to be based on yourself and on the other person. And this again is where that body language, you know, really taking notice of the body language of other people is going to support you. Because there are some people and they are a big hugger. So they're more than happy to hug you on that first meeting, on that first connection. And you're going to notice it. You know, they're going to be far more open and inviting. Whereas if someone, you know, is less keen to have a hug and some people may not even want to, you know, shake hands on meeting now, you know, society has really changed over this last few years with physical connection, with physical touch. So it's being aware and it's also being aware of how you are acting. And that was obviously, you know, touched on in the previous presentation so it's being aware of how you are communicating with whoever it is that you're communicating with and to make sure that you're communicating how you want to be so if you want to appear open then have a bit of a practice with yourself at home you know if you have a mirror practice with the mirror if you haven't pop your camera on your um you know on your computer or on your phone and have a practice with that and a side benefit of that is you're going to get, you know, be practicing being in front of camera as well. So just practicing looking at yourself, connecting with yourself and watching how you look when you're speaking. So I love um, when people are beginning 
you know, with their practicing being confident and things like that is to actually get them to practice things in front of the mirror or again in front of the camera. Because as you just go through and you can practice a presentation, not only are you practicing that presentation so that when you actually give it to your clients, your potential clients, you know, you've practiced it, you know what you're doing and it's going to come across far more smoothly. But also you're going to be aware of those little tiny idiosyncrasies, those little tiny things that you may do. Now, when I was very first doing presentations um, such as this, and I couldn't see people because I definitely work with people, I definitely feed off their energy um, in a good way. So in a way that I can then respond and I can change how I'm speaking, I can maybe go into more detail if I notice that people don't understand. But when speaking to a camera, you're literally you're just speaking to yourself. So you can see yourself, but you have to kind of, you know, just accept that you don't get to see the audience in these situations. So what I used to do, I just used to speak for a very, very long time and I forget to drink. And I think even on some of my early Zen, the ones I had, you know, a little bit of a, a kind of, you, you know, everything goes in like dips and troughs and I definitely dip down and I would forget to breathe. And it's that simple because you're so focused on whatever the information is that you're sharing. You can forget really, really simple things like that to absolutely pay attention to yourself and then just draw back to that little tiny practice that I mentioned right near the beginning where you're just asking yourself how you feel. And when you're checking in with yourself as you're going through a presentation, then you can make sure to stop, pause and have a quick drink if that's what you need. And I think every time that I share that, I always then go, oh, yeah, do you know what? I do fancy a quick drink. So for yourselves as well, you know, make sure that you are checking in with yourself, especially when you are working on the computer, because your communication with yourself is really important. And your health, your hydration, making sure you're taking screen breaks, you know, those are really, really important. So again, check in and have that, com uh, that communication, that good connection with yourself, because you deserve to listen to yourself and to respect yourself enough to actually ask how you are feeling um, throughout your day. And even if you are doing, you know, like a live presentation, just make sure that you're staying connected to you. OK, so when you're thinking about yourself, you know, obviously you can take a look at how you are presenting when you're speaking to people and you can practice and you can role play out situations, especially if there's one that you are having a little bit of old anxiety or a little bit of old resistance to yourself. Practice it. Because the more that you practice speaking, connecting, the easier it's going to be when you're actually doing it with somebody else there on the other side. So practice your relationship with yourself. You get to practice talking to yourself, listening to yourself, and actually actively listening to yourself. So when you ask yourself, how are you feeling, really actively pay attention to what the response is. And you can dig a bit deeper underneath that. So, for example, you might be feeling hungry and then you can dig underneath, right, what exactly do I get to put into my body now that's going to support me, you know, for now and for the rest of the day. So make sure that you're going deeper with your questions with yourself. And again, that's going to support you when you're speaking with somebody else to go deeper with that communication and with that connection too. Because the way that we're going to understand anything from anyone else is to ask questions. You get to begin by practicing, practicing that with you or indeed if you've got any colleagues, if you've got any um, friends or family that are with you, then start practicing your communication and practicing your active listening. And when you are practicing that active listening and you're practicing just connecting with that person when they're speaking, also make sure that you do have some eye contact. I think that eyes are such a big gateway into how people are. And it can really give you a lot of detail about how that person 
is behaving. Now, obviously, we don't actually know how people are feeling unless we ask them, because all we can see is the outside behavior and how they're feeling inside is could potentially be under so many different layers that we can't really guess, we can't mind read how someone else is feeling. But we can pay attention to their tone. And we did that little exercise um, with David earlier. And that's going to give you an example of how they're behaving, the feelings that they're showing to you. And it may well be that they're feeling something else completely different underneath. And that's another thing for you to be practicing is to be checking how you're feeling and then to be noticing, is that coming across in your communication? And for me, one of the biggest um, kind of developments is in confidence is when you're confident enough to be there, to be interacting with people and to be you know, showing what you're feeling, to be open with what you're feeling, because everybody feels different things. And we have moments in the day where we may be doing tiredness, we'll have moments in the day where we may be really, really motivated. And we'll have moments in the day when we're feeling, you know, really calm. And you can draw on each of them. But I feel that the best communication is a really pure and open communication. And I think David touched on it when he was speaking about the work that he'd done before, we you know with his own confidence on camera. And I think the clearer you can be, the more you that you can be when you're connecting, when you're communicating, be it like this on a live screen, be it in person with somebody, be it in an interactive live webinar, the more honest and authentically yourself that you can be. So the more comfortable you are at being yourself, the more confident you are at being yourself, the easier those connections and communications will be for you. Because when we've put up all these different filters in front of ourselves, so we may be doing really, really tired, but we put on a really, really like motivated, energetic persona. And again, that's amazing to do if you're doing some video because it's going to be more inviting for your audience. Absolutely. So definitely you get to do it. But you'll notice that when you do that, when you perhaps record something and maybe it's a promotion for your new course, um, for your new membership site, and you put all of this energy in, you get to the end of it. And you may well find that you are doing tired because you've expended all of that extra energy. Whereas if you could, prior to doing that recording, if you could be well rested, if you could be well hydrated, if you can be well nourished, you're going to have naturally that energy and that's going to be a much easier practice for you. It's going to be a much more enjoyable experience because rather than putting yourself into that motivation and that high energy, you can naturally get yourself there by looking after yourself. So again, communication, the more natural it is, the more easy and effortless it is, then the better that connection is going to be, the better your communication is going to be, and the less extra energy you're going to be expending by pretending to be feeling something that you perhaps are not. So if you, another quick way to get into um, that motivational state, if you are looking um, at doing promotional videos, or even just, you know, this kind of stuff where you're doing some training, is beforehand, you can put on like a little music track that will get you into that motivated state, that will get you into that excited state, that will get you into that bright and awake state. You can just play that track for a couple of minutes um, before you go and do the filming or before you go and do the live, before you go and have that meeting. And music is amazing at helping us feel different. So it's great at helping shift our emotions. And again, it's that all comes into the body language because your emotions are going to present themselves in the way that you move. They're also going to present themselves in your tone of voice. So the better you can have your communication with your emotions behind it, the easier and the clearer that's going to be. Now, that wasn't clear what I just said then. So I'm going to clarify it because communication gets to be clear and gets to be connected. 
So if you're about to go and do a live, you're about to go and do a promotional video, anything like that, then make sure that you are feeling how you want to be feeling when you give the presentation. And a good way to work out how you want to be feeling is think about the other person, so the person that's on the receiving side of that communication, how do you want them to be feeling when they receive the information, when they enjoy the course, when they look at the promotional video, when they're watching you, you know, within that training, how do you want them to be feeling? Probably you're going to want them to be feeling motivated, um, curious. If it's something where you're actually supporting people to be calm, you're going to want them to feel calm. And above all, you're always going to want them to feel connected, connected to you in whatever communication you are sharing with them. So when you then know how you want that other person or those other people to feel when you're presenting the information, then you can go and pick a piece of music which makes you feel that emotion. And that's a little bit of a, like a, a top tip, a little trick to shift you into that emotion before you do that piece of work and before you give out that communication. And that's really going to support you. So clarity and understanding. So when you're thinking of communication, as I've touched on, like throughout the whole thing, you've got yourself. And so you're giving out that communication and you're giving it out by your words, you're giving it out by how you look, you're giving it out by how you're moving. Um, you also, believe it or not, are going to be given out by how you smell as well. Um, there's not a huge amount that you can do to change that, although obviously keep yourself clean and fresh smelling. Um, and then you've got the other person over here. Um, I'm going to do other people. And so they're then receiving all that information from you across all those different ways. And what you get to ensure is that whatever you're putting across is clear. So when you're speaking with people, you get to make sure that your language is clear, that you can clearly be heard. And I'm sourcing that you can clearly hear how I'm speaking, that my language is coming across to you clearly throughout this presentation. And again, that's another practice for you to do to really build up your communication skills. Then have a practice at speaking at a different pace. So practice speaking at your normal speaking rate, practice speaking really, really fast and practice speaking really slow. Because believe it or not, you are going to actually draw on each of those speeds as you go through things. And what you'll notice is that when you really slow down the rate of your speech, then it can really define things. So it can really make them stand out for people. And if you're speaking really, really fast, you're obviously going to get um, less words are going to be taken in because you're going really, really quick. And some people can process really, really fast um, audio, but some people don't. So when you're speaking really, really fast, it may be that people aren't necessarily getting the detail that you're speaking, but they will be getting that feeling. They'll be getting that feeling of excitement, of energy, because you're going really, really fast paced. So when you are communicating, sometimes that's going to be how you want it to go. They don't need to have all of the detail in what you're saying, because perhaps it's a huge amount of detail anyway. But what they will get is that tone, is that energy behind your communication. So have a bit of a practice um, just now, actually, and you can say a day with Zenla. So just practice saying that at your normal speaking pace. And then practice saying it a slow speaking pace. <gasps> My guinea pig is back. back. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll do it normal pace. So a day with Zenla. So I'll do it slow. A day with Zenla. Or a day with Zenla. <laughs> I love it. 
I love I'll that. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much to my awesome, awesome assistant. <laughs> and what you may have noticed, like I certainly did, when David really slowed his speech down, um, I really, really was drawn in. And that you can draw on. So draw in on the drawing in um, with people, because when you do slow your speech down, it's different and it really stands out. So if there's a really important part that you want to highlight in your communication, in your connection, in your presentation, in your promotion, perhaps it's going to be the call to action. You could slow down at that point and it's going to highlight it within your whole presentation, within your whole connection, your whole communication. And then to what, you know, with the fast one, obviously we knew the words he was saying anyway, but if you didn't know the words, then it may well be that you didn't necessarily catch every single syllable when you're going really, really quick, but you get that overall feeling. So again, that's another really handy thing to do if you are promoting something, if you're inspiring people to go and take the action, you could perhaps be speaking at your normal pace, then you speak really, really fast to build up the excitement and to build up the energy. And then you can go really slow with your call to action. And by using your pace of speaking, also that's using your tone. And as you probably notice, you're using your body language as well. And when you put all of those things together, your communication, your connection with your audience, with your clients, also with your friends and family, it can really begin to up level itself. And you'll be really surprised at the different reactions that you get with people. So I'd love for you to experiment with that as well. Um, and absolutely, if you have any feedback um, with any of these exercises, if you try them in your next promotion, in your next live, you know, maybe even with the next tricky conversation you're going to be having, um, you know, with your partner, with a friend, anything, then do feedback um, because it'd be really great to know how you get on with it and to see how your communication begins to change. And obviously, here to support you know within the group however I can as well and when you're thinking about that it's also worth bearing in mind that everybody's experience everybody's history everybody's like picture of the world everybody's model of the world is going to be completely different so do be mindful of that if for example you're going to um, raise your voice and you want to be you know really like authoritarian anything like that in your speech is it's worth bearing in mind that that may not be a way of communication that everybody responds to well so it's also about thinking about where your audience um, or where your friends and family, whoever it is that you are having that communication, that connection with, it's worth thinking about how they are in that moment as well. And that's again, where watching their body language, seeing how they're behaving in that moment is gonna help and support you to have the best connected communication that you can. Because for example, if somebody, you know, is perhaps in a job where they're getting shouted at a lot, then if you go and raise your voice, it can immediately trigger, you know, a resistance, a barrier, like a safety mechanism. And you may find that, you know, they physically will draw back or they may just seem to like glaze over so they can switch off because that's our natural instincts. So that's, you know, our really simple, our fight, flight, freeze. Um, and they've added in like a, a new one, which is like faff about. So it's when you're not quite sure what you're going to be doing and you can have really interesting like body language and really interesting eye patterns that show up at that point um so it's almost like the moment before the deer in headlights where you freeze it's that bit before where you're like oh my goodness i'm not quite sure what to do so you've got each of those four instinctual things which are going to be happening all the time um, no matter what communication no matter what is going on for people throughout their environment so it's worth paying attention to how people are presenting themselves, to the behavior that you can see from them, and also to bear in mind any history of that person 
or indeed that animal, because obviously we can communicate with animals and that's not necessarily in a spoken way because they don't really understand unless you've trained them, unless you've trained a response to a specific word or a specific tone. But it's just worth watching, you know, become an active listener and become an active watcher too. Become really observant of yourself first because that's going to practice your skills. Because when you start to notice how you're looking, you start to notice your own body language more. It's going to enable you to notice it with everybody else so much more easily. So take a video of yourself doing a presentation, um, you know, just stand there and speak as if you're having a conversation with somebody, you know, and perhaps if there's a conversation that hasn't gone as well as you wanted it to, you could just record yourself having your part of the conversation and just notice what you can see about it. Or you can also just close your eyes and go back to that conversation and notice how you are, notice how the other person is. Notice how you're both looking with your body language. Notice how you're speaking with that tone of voice and notice the words that you're using. Because as we begin to like heighten up our stress levels, our words tend to get shorter. Our sentences tend to get shorter and far more abrupt so that you're actually just giving over, you know, the tiny bits of information that in that moment you feel are really, really important. So notice that. And also, if you've had a conversation or perhaps a client conversation, perhaps a potential client conversation that went really, really well, again, close your eyes and go back to that moment. Go back to that conversation and notice how did you look? How did they look? Obviously, if it's on the telephone, it's you know, a bit more limited. But how was the tone of their voice? How is the tone of your voice? Do you notice that you're in rapport? Are you matching tone? Are you matching the pace of speaking? Because these are things that we do naturally. So with your friends and family, you will naturally match their body language. You will naturally be matching their tone of voice and you'll naturally be matching the pace of their voice as well. So that's another thing to notice, you know, with friends and family. Do you find, you know, when you're speaking to somebody or perhaps when you're watching somebody, um, you know, like this doing a live, do you find that you're copying, you're matching what they're doing? So, for example, there, how many of you actually then reach for a drink? because you see me drink and you go, oh yeah, actually I need to drink too. And so it can support, it can trigger you to do things. And if you're in rapport, then you might find that, you know, somebody adjusts their hair or they just, you know, move their hand below their chin. You may find that you're naturally doing that as well. So notice that when you're doing it. And then when you do have a live audience in front of you, when you've got someone face to face that you're communicating with, it's a great test of rapport and connection just to do a tiny, tiny interaction. So you might perhaps, you know, put your hand up on your shoulder. Or again, you might, you know, just touch your hair and just notice how many people, when you do this practice, how many people do the same? How much rapport, how much connection do you have within that communication in that moment? And again, if you're using that to get yourself into a better rapport, to improve your connection, and you're mirroring what someone else is doing, then you don't have to do the exact same thing. So, for example, if they touch their hair, you could just, you know, you could touch a different part of your hair. It doesn't have to be the same one. If they suddenly cross their legs, you don't have to cross your legs. You could just cross your hands over. So there are many different ways that you can practice with that. And there's obviously many more resources on it. Um, and if you've got any questions, you know, drop it below in the chat. And I'd be more than happy, you know, to share some other sort of examples of that within, within the group. Did you want to practice something? No, I was just I was just saying about that. This um, mirroring um, is quite a common thing on people. I mean, the classic one is yawning. You watch how many people yawn if you do it in a public environment. It's just amazing. Yeah, I, 
I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I fall asleep. <laughs> But yeah, that mirroring side is, uh, yeah, it's it's quite a common uh, thing. Mamit's put in there, when I watch a lot of English movies, web series, my accent changes a lot all of a sudden. So uh, that would be funny. I want Mamit to come in and speak like French or have a French accent. <laughs> that sounds like another session. Yeah. No, that was brilliant, Liz. Are you are you finished now, or are you wrapping? Yeah, up? Yeah, I can be. Okay, because um, yeah, that's great. I mean, the whole thing about uh, you know, actually communication, and and I really love like you know watching what's going on and and those sort of things because it's uh, it's a very key thing. It's funny today is all about communication, being good on camera, all of these things. So it's all sort of dovetailing. This wasn't planned, you know, this was just these speakers coming on. <laughs> but I want to I want to I want to say a little bit about an upcoming challenge that Liz actually has uh, where she'll be teaching you well you 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 explain it Liz I'll just screen share so I can show I can show the actual page and then you can just uh, maybe elaborate on it for a little bit yeah of course Ooh, how exciting okay yeah. so following on um from actually to be honest all the day was endless i think i've done since the beginning <laughs> so since before i even was you know part of the awesome team zenda here um it's all about for me it's all about mindset because as i've touched on here today when you're dealing with communication you're going to communicate with yourself first and to be in a great place of communication you get to have a great mindset so you get to be aware of how you are so with the wonderful, wonderful Kevin, I'm hosting the Mindset Boot Camp. So this is five days to support you to start to shift your mindset and to begin to utilize um, you because you are amazing and your brain is amazing and it can do such awesome things for you. And the more connected you are with it, the easier everything becomes. So we're gonna be going through five different areas. We're gonna be moving you from overwhelm to clarity, which is awesome as course creators, because how often can we feel overwhelmed? And especially with the amazing, huge amount of resources, the amazing like abilities that New Zenma has for us, it can become overwhelming. You know, where do you begin? What do you start with? So we're gonna be covering that um, overwhelmed clarity so that you will be clear what your next step is. Um, and you'll also have the tools so that you can then go ahead and, you know, build up like a bigger, clarity of where you want to be going overall also going to be moving you from procrastination to focus because you know again you may have 500 different things that you want to do and you're like ah oh, where do i start which one do i do which one do i do and even when you get to the one task that you want to be doing it's still really easy to procrastinate about what your next step is so again moving you from procrastination into focus and this is going to support you with your new zen the work but across your life as well because mindset you know obviously it's you so it's across your whole entire life also moving from low confidence to confident and that's a massive one so we're going to be starting with all of these things these are all going to be beginnings but if you go through and you do the five days and do them live if you can do because i feel you know as i've spoken before today live is better because you get that interaction you can ask us questions when you're there in the moment and i know that kevin will be an amazing resource you know within all of this as well um he's awesome too so the next one will be frustration to calm because it's very easy to be frustrated and you know especially over these last few years society everything has really really changed and shifted so to be able to get yourself calm if you can be calm and i think for a lot of people you know a big thing that they're aiming for a great big mission a big sort of life goal is to be able to be calm no matter what is going on around you now i can't promise you that level of calmness in the five days but certainly stick with it and then take these tools take these practices and keep practicing them that journey to calm is like a lifelong journey but we will definitely be able to get you so that you can shift from frustration to calm 
you know, with some really good quick top tips and practices and then stuck to flow. Because when any of these things come up, overwhelm, procrastination, low confidence, frustration, old anxiety, old stresses, old tensions, old strain, they can cause us to be stuck. So we get to shift all of those out of the way and begin for you to be able to flow freely as yourself, to be able to be self-aware, to be able to be self-connected. And the more connected and calm, clearly confident you are, the more clear, calm and confident everything around you is going to be. And that's going to really, really put you at an amazing level with your courses, with your memberships, with your lives, with everything, because you're going to be coming from a place that not many people are coming from. Not many people have that basic underlying calmness within their mindset. And these are going to be some really awesome tools that are going to support you going forward um, well, for the rest of your life. Yeah, this is this is amazing. You need you need to take. I'm going to be jumping into this as well. I'm going to be attending as a student, um, so I'll give any of my points of view across in the chat. But it is Kevin is hosting this uh, with uh, Liz, who is as we put there the mindset tutor. So she's going to be doing this. And what's going to be great about it, Liz? Are you going to expect people to be on camera? Yes, I do. I, it's better if they can be. But I do understand that you may begin the week and you may not be confident to be on camera yet. So, you know, notice that everyone is welcome. If you can't be on camera, if you're not ready for that level of commitment, you know, in that present moment, then that is fine because this is to support everybody. But if you can be on camera, I can definitely support you more because I can see you. And the more that I can see you, the more that I can hear you, the more that I can connect with you, the more I can support you to, you know, build up whatever areas um, you're looking to improve. So, and also, you know, you'll be able to feed back in and then perhaps in another day with Emma, I can go deeper into other areas too. Yeah. And maybe, you know, after this, you'll be confident enough to come on the day with Emma. And that would be that would be awesome. So what I'd like to see with this is like some a lot of people with their cameras maybe turned off at first because they don't feel confident. And then by the end of it, day five, all the cameras to be on. That would be just amazing because you would actually see an actual flow through. I think this is going to be great. And also remember that going through this, this uh, boot camp, Liz and Kevin will point out the way we can support you as well, such as the co-working session, Zen Zone, such as things like Zen Chat. You know, all these things can build your confidence up going forward, which will all be mentioned throughout. Um, these frustrations are calm. I mean, it's such a massive one. All five of those points could, in their own right, be challenges. You know, pro pro procrastination to focus is a big one. How many times have people like, oh, I'm, I'll do that. This week, I want to do that. I need to finish that course. And then they don't, they forget about it. And they get frustrated then because the frustration to calm, which is another key point, is like, because they haven't done it. And then they beat themselves up about it. And all these things, you know, it's all in the mind. It's all the way you look at it. And it's going to be great because obviously Liz is our expert on the mind. So that's why I'm, I'm super excited. I've got to attend this one because I even I I'm, I'm quite prolific with what I produce. But sometimes a lot of these points do come up that I'm stuck with certain things like where do I go from here? What am I doing next? And those kind of things in a way because I'm doing too many things and it's just to calm it all down. So Liz is really good with me like privately she calms me down if i need to if i need calming down in any way i can talk to to liz and you know she's she helps us at zenla as well so it's super cool <laughs> <laughs> right one other thing so i'm going to put that in the in the comments i'm going to put the link to this so you can jump in pre-register now and you're going now when is this happening it's happening in september isn't it liz yes it ends on the 23rd which is the Friday. Yeah, so that week back from the from there. Um, so uh, that will be put on here as well. I'm going to put that on this page. So I'll put that into the comments. And the other thing I want to say is last month, I think it was last month, that um, Liz did a meditation. And this was really 
really really popular because they they were short like little uh, resets that you could reset the slightly longer meditations. she did about five of them in total and what we did was we extracted the audio and put some audio tracks behind it and i'm going to put this link in the chat as well so guys like if you're feeling stressed or that and you need calming down it's definitely worth downloading this um audio tracks in here this download this zip file quite large uh, it's high quality um video um audio in there and also you've got the actual uh zen state where liz is walking you through that as well and that was in last time hours i think it was last last month yeah. wasn't it liz? yeah i lose track with these days then because so <laughs> much happens so liz is on there on her own so if you want to watch her just doing that zen state <clears throat> which is what we called it she'll be on there and you can download that so i'll put that in the chat as well and uh that should be you sorted out for the mind so september by the end of september you will be zen you know that's it you'll just be zend zend out <laughs> so fabulous that's brilliant okay so we have thank you liz that was amazing thank you so much <laughs> right next slot it's just all go today we have the amazing mammy here and you know as promised on last month's day with zendler She's going to be teaching basic Japanese to you guys. Basic communication again. It all fits. You know, it's amazing. And also she has her husband on as well. So a warm welcome. Um, how, how do I pronounce your husband's name? Sidhant. Sidhant? Yes, Sidhant. Sidhant, good to see you. Oh, you've got the Zen in the background as well. It's <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> That's really good. That's really nice. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Mammy. She's going to take it away and teach us basic Japanese. Uh, by the way, they both speak Japanese. So oh, yes. <laughs> you're in safe hands. So take it away. See you later. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. So my name is Mammy and my partner, Sadhan, today. Like we promised in the last day with Zenda that we are going to be covering some basics of Japanese today. So just give me a moment. I'll share my screen. Is my screen visible? Sadan, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Okay. So I was watching the sessions in the morning and as David said that this morning is all about presentation and communication. And language also is a large part of communication. And then we also saw in the discussion that mirroring is also one way of communicating. And if you are trying to learn a language, then one of the best ways is shadowing or mirroring. So I think the entire morning slot is more to do with presentation and communication. Now, as I've already shared, we decided in the last day with Zenler that we are going to be covering the basics of Japanese. Today, I, along with my partner, and will be covering the basics. Now, to start with, the first question is that why are we so passionate about Japanese? And uh, why is that a common link between both of us? So we met together in IBM where we were working and the common link was because we both knew Japanese. That's how we started talking. That's how we were in the same office. So in some way, I can say Japanese has been the cupid for us. So that's why it always holds a special place in our heart. All right. So in today's presentation, I'm going to be covering a little more about the theory and most of the intonations and the tonality and pronunciations Siddhant will be covering because it's been a while that I'm in the industry since I switched to digital marketing. I have lost that perfection. I can still speak, but I am not up to par perfection. And Siddhant is still in the industry, so he has a better hand at pronunciation. Mm -hmm. And let's get started with it. So the first thing is the content and the outline. Today in this presentation, we are going to be covering the three scripts that Japanese has the pronunciations, the basic greetings so that next time when you meet a Japanese person, maybe online, offline, you can use these basic greetings to get started with them. Some common phrases, very easy ones, and then some resources so that if you're interested, you can go ahead and learn more about it. 
Now let's begin with our experience. So I uh, did my undergraduate in Bachelor of Arts and simultaneously I was also learning Japanese language as a diploma course for three years, basic, intermediate and advanced, one for each year. And I was doing that because I just didn't want to stay connected to something basic, which is graduation. I wanted to do something extra. And also I had that in mind that if I do something which is quickly, I can get started with my career really soon. And that's how I started working at 19 or 20 years of age. So when I did my uh, Japanese diploma three years, I went on doing different jobs, such as I was a trainer for Japanese people living in India. I used to teach them English. There used to be three kinds of people, uh, corporates, business owners, then females who were homeowners, and then very small kids, two to three years. And then I did several part-time jobs, and then I joined IBM, where, of course, I met Sidhan. And December 2019, I decided to take a little shift and add on digital marketing as my skill. And that's my experience with the language. And Sadan, I would like to share, I would like you to share your experience as well. Yeah. Thank you, Vanmeet. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sadan, Sadan Nile. The reason I chose Japanese is a little different. Uh, since my school, I wanted to pursue something which was out of the box and excel in a skill which was not considered to be mainstream. So I, and Asian language uh, really impressed me. So as a result, I graduated uh, in Japanese with, uh, from English and Foreign Language University, which is situated, situated in the southern part of India, Hyderabad, uh, in, in Hyderabad, India. So uh, just like Manmeet, uh, during my college days, I got also got an opportunity as an, uh, to be on a scholarship program uh, called Genesis. And since then, uh, I have a uh, vast experience uh, in this field from working from an industrial sector to an IT sector. I have uh, worked with major brands like uh, Hitachi, l &T, and then IBM, of course. And uh, I'm currently still working in uh, IBM. It's been for more than four five years since I'm working in IBM. And yeah, I completely forgot awesome. that I had to mention that I've been on a scholarship program as well. That's how out of all the Asian languages, I chose Japanese because before learning the language in my 12th standard, I got an opportunity to be in Japan for 10, 12 days on a scholarship program. So that's why I chose Japanese. So maybe the stars are connected already. Thank all you. right, <laughs> let's move forward. Now, uh, we have different scripts in Japanese uh, catering to the different phrases and words that we say. The first script that we have is hiragana. Now, the words that are Japanese origin words, those are used in the hiragana script. Now, uh, Sadhan, could you share a few examples, the words which would be spoken in hiragana, some Japanese origin words? Like, like watashi, that means I. Okay, so, so uh, words like, like anata, what? like you, these are... Japanese words. Okay. Or so, the, yeah, sure. Go on. Go ahead. Yes. So, words like you and I would be in every language, but then every language has a word for it. So, watashi is a word that has come from the Japanese language. That is why that word will be written in hiragana. So, every word that is originated from Japan in their language is spoken in the first script, which is the hiragana script. Is that good to go? Okay. Yes, yes. So the second script we have is katagana. That is all the words that are foreign to them. Now, what could be the foreign words? Like my name, Sadhan's name, your name, any word that is not originated in the language is a katagana word. For example, if I remember correctly, the word sauce is also a foreign word, right? Yes. And the word toilet would also be a foreign word because Japanese have some would have some other word to speak toilet in their language. So different words like these would have a different would have their pronunciation in katagana. Now what we did was we took the names of our team and both of us and we put it on screen for you because all these names are foreign words. 
and one by one, I would request Siddhan to pronounce them at least twice so that all of us can understand how does foreign words sound in the Japanese language. So first okay. is my name. You can get, go ahead with your name first. Okay. <laughs> my name in English is Manik, but when it comes to Japanese, it becomes Mamito. So that's, that's Mamito. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the second one is mine and it is pronounced as in English, it is Siddhant, but in Japanese, since uh, there is not just a uh, sound in uh, Japanese, so it will either uh, the end of the sound, end of the name will be either a. Ah. So the name, uh, my name comes to be uh, Siddhanta. So it won't be there just as Siddhant, but it will be Siddhanta. Then the next name is uh, David English, but in Japanese it will be like David Do. David Do. Then the second one is Kevin. It was it is it remains the same in Japanese as well. That will be Kevin. Then the next name is Rakesh. Again, uh, all the sounds, uh, all the sounds are there in Japanese as well. So the name remains the same. Rakesh. Rakesh Shu. Not so. That will be Shu. Rakesh Shu. <laughs> then uh, for Liz, it will be Rizu. Rizu. Then for Alice, it will be Arisu. Arisu. I think the reason behind in Liz name it becomes Rizu is because there is no pronunciation of L in the Japanese language. Am I right? Correct. So L becomes L. The uh, very similar sound in Japanese, it will turn to the most similar sound in Japanese and then uh, that's why uh, L turns to L, uh, R, Re, Riz. Also, if we go back on the screen, we will see even in the Hiragana script and the Katagana script, all the alphabets that are in Japanese are of double pronunciation, whereas English alphabets are single on their own. So that is why when we were changing the names from our origin words to katagana, my name has to in the last instead of the. Then Siddhant has Siddhanta instead of the. So that is also why the last letter of the words are changing. Right, Siddhant? Correct. Okay. So we need like to go, yeah, go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, I was saying that uh, since uh, Japanese does not have all the uh, pronunciation in English. So we move to the nearest pronunciation, which is uh, nearest pronunciation possible to the English. That's why uh, there is slight changes in our name. Absolutely. And uh, also I was saying that all these words are foreign words because our names are not native names in Japanese. So the first script that is hiragana will always be used when those words or objects or things have been originated in Japan in their language. If they are from a foreign country and it is not their own, they will all come under katagana. And the third script is a slightly difficult script and it takes years and years to memorize it because I have done that, so I can say, and it's called kanji. So if you see on my screen, this is actually a picto pictography. And today morning, when we were discussing about the presentation, uh, we were discussing that why was actually kanji formed. So Siddhant very nicely explained it to me that if there are similar words in the language, let's say there is a word called hashi. So a hashi also means the chopsticks that Japanese use, and it also means bridge. So if I write hashi in hiragana, I will never understand that what is the person trying to say. If it is in a form of a picture, looking at that picture, I can identify whether this hashi is of chopsticks or whether this hashi is for a bridge. That is why kanji has come in. And this script in Japanese has unlimited 
I don't know, uh, characters in it. And it can go on. As much as you learn, you will keep getting a little confused, to be honest. Because it takes time to learn it. I remember in my days, I used to have a whiteboard, whiteboard at my house. I used to learn them and keep writing on that. And whichever I used to forget the most often, I would make a list and put it on my board for the entire week so that I get eyes on it every single day. And uh, with kanji, uh, in Japanese also you have, uh, like in English we have IELTS. We give IELTS to prove our proficiency. In Japanese we give JLPT. So that's N5, N4, N3, N2, N1 being the last. I just wanted to ask Siddhant, I don't remember now, how many characters should you know in the most basic exam? That's nine, uh, N5. How many kanji characters guess, should you know? At least... Uh... 60 to 70 kanjis you need to learn. Okay. Or and probably how, I don't even, And yeah. how many do we need to know to pass the most uh, senior exam? That's N1. Uh, 2,500 plus. Okay. So or, that's... Or 3,000. <laughs> so that's the kind of number. If you want to pursue Japanese, you must know about 50 to 60 of these characters in your most basic exam. And then the top most, of course, you will be very close to a native if you pass that exam. That has about 2,500 to 3,000 characters. Moving forward in the next slide, I have a small video for you because I wanted to show you that how these characters are written. So it's a very small video writing one character and it will just show you how the brush moves. And when you write these kind of kanjis, you also have to remember which stroke comes first and which comes second, if I'm correct. I don't remember now. Yes. But when we are writing correct. this, if I do not follow the actual instruction, I might end up not doing it accurately. I have to follow the stroke order, right? Correct. Stroke order is uh, very much important in uh, writing kanjis because... Uh, Strokes tells us uh, which part of the character should be thicker and which part of the character should be thinner. So that is, that's why stroke order is very important. Okay. All right. So let's move forward. And now we will be talking a little about the alphabets in Japanese. So very common to English, the starting of the four, five vowels are same. That is, Sadhan, can you please pronounce it correctly? That is in English, it is A, but in in Japanese, it is A. We pronounce it, it as A. Then the second one is in English, you can see that is I, but in Japanese, it is E. The third one is in English, it is U, but in Japanese, it is U. I'll come again. It is U. Then the fourth one is in English, it is E, but in Japanese it is A. The fifth one and the last one is in English it is O and it remains the same in Japanese as well. That's O. So that will be A E U A O. E. Correct. A E U A O. So these are the vowels in Japanese and combining these vowels with the consonants, we form the entire script or the alphabet, I might say, in Japanese. If you see, I have linked the vowels towards the right, and then all the supporting characters are on the left. And if you see, there is a line. Uh, on the very top, it is K, S, T, N, H, M, Y, R, W, N. So let's say I combine K and A, it will become Ka. I combine S and A, it will become Sa. Similarly, I combine K and E, it will become Ki. Then K and U, Ku. K and A, K. K and O, Ko. So, Ka, Ki, Ku, Ke, Ko. Similarly, if I keep on going with each line, this will be Sa, Shi, Su, Se, So. Ta, Chi, Su, Te, To. Na, Ni, Nu, Ne, No. Ha, Hi, Hu. Ha, he, fu, he, ho. That's an exception. 
<laughs> and then the the third one in ta as well that is ta and u does not make tu that will be su su like like in the word tsunami tsunami is a japanese word in english we write it with uh, t s u n a m i but we read it as tsunami but in japanese it is actually pronounced as tsunami okay and also i have a i over the chat david is just asking does a, does it not take ages to write in japanese so even we thought that david but i'll share my experience when i went to my class the first day the first session the first time i had to learn japanese my teacher uh, my sensei since teacher is sensei in japanese so the entire one hour two hour class she was speaking in japanese and then the first day we were given the entire script to learn and by the fourth day that is the second class i had to memorize everything so we had at least i did not have a option because mine was a little diploma kind sort of a crash course so i had to learn as fast as possible so i was given the entire script in the first class to learn it by the second class yes sir and i yes uh, i think that was uh, you mean with uh, with script you mean uh, hiragana and katakana not kanji yes. Yes, yes 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 hiragana or katakana kanji was introduced much later but the entire alphabets of hiragana were given in one day i mean the first class itself and the teacher was only speaking in japanese you had to judge what she is saying by her actions by her tonality or by the way she is pointing at you she will not speak in english for the entire session that's what happened with me and i think that happened with you as well correct all right so once again i'll just read the entire one and we'll move forward so the first line is ka ki ku ke ko second sa shi su se so third ta chi su te to fourth na ni nu ne no fifth ha hi fu he ho then m ma mi mu me mo then ya yu yo then ra ri ru re ro then wa vi we wo oh that's o and then mm. okay let's move forward so now we are going to be starting the most exciting part that is the greetings in japanese these are very simple because you can start speaking them it is not very essential for you to write the language if you do not want to pursue it as a, a career maybe or you do not want to learn learn it but you just want to use it for learning something new you can start speaking it from day one they are easy in pronunciation so uh, i will this section primarily i will be handing over to sudan because like i said he is the best when it comes to pronunciation so i'll take over to the first screen okay so this is uh, the word hajime mashite hajime mashite this is the word you say when you meet a person for the first time remember for the, uh, you are meeting a person for the very first time uh, you won't uh, say this word se uh, second or the third time you will have to say this is this word for the, only for the first time when you meet a person you will say haji me mashte yeah please tell me i think this is the right situation like you met david for the first time so you will tell david haji me mashte correct haji me mashte that means uh, let's start yeah okay i'll move it to the second screen and let's try to say it twice or thrice so that they understand the tonality of it yeah sure and people can also uh, join us and uh, they can speak on their in their own you what sadhan is trying to say is that you can follow us and try to speak and if you have any feedback are you able to do it correctly if you think you have any questions you can put it in the chat box on uh, facebook and i'll keep an eye on it yeah that's great yeah. yes <laughs> thank you yeah and uh, for good morning we say in japanese ohayo 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 
Yes, this is the casual one. But when you uh, meet somebody formally, you'll say Ohio Gozaimas, or a teacher or a person in yeah Ohio Gozaimas. Like when you are uh, greeting somebody in office or or uh, when a teacher when a student uh, greets their teacher, they'll say Ohio Gozaimas. Okay, I'll try repeating. Ohio gozaimasu. Yes, ohio gozaimasu. Ohio gozaimasu. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll uh, point out one thing that uh, in English you can see uh, there is su at the end. The last letter of ohio gozaimasu in uh, Japanese as well uh, writes as su, but while speaking we say ma uh, masu, not su. We'll say Ohio Gozaimas. We won't uh, pronounce it as Ohio Gozaimasu. That is not correct. We'll pronounce it as Ohio Gozaimas. Ohio Gozaimas. Correct. Okay. So maybe you can say once and I can repeat twice so that everybody can get the tone of it. Correct. Okay. Let's move forward. Yes. Okay. So this is uh, Konnichiwa. 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 Good afternoon. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Correct. Okay, I'll go one more time. Konnichiwa. Correct. Okay. And this is used for good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Let's get to the next screen. Okay, so for good evening. We say konbanwa. 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 Correct. Okay. Konbanwa. Here, can you explain the mm coming in the konbanwa so that it's a little clear yeah. how to speak? So, yes, uh, here, like that is mm, like uh, you have the sound should be the nasal sound. So, it will be like kong, konbanwa. So the sound should be nasal here. Konbanwa. 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 Correct. Konbanwa. Yeah. Okay, let's and, move. Uh, one thing I need to uh, point out here that uh, the intonation goes straight for uh, in Japanese words. Like in English, we go from uh, higher to lower somewhere in some particular words but in Japanese the intonation is the same as in the stress on each word is the same in English correct. we might stress one letter or one uh, part of the word more but in Japanese all the characters have the equal amount of stress in them correct okay okay so for goodbye I think everyone uh, everybody knows this word yeah, uh, this is sayonara. 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 Correct. Sayonara. 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 Okay. <laughs> we won't say goodbye. We have a lot <laughs> to talk right now. <laughs> okay, next one. And uh, so, okay. Uh, while we say this word as an if you are meeting somebody uh, again, Generally, people say jamata. 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 That means jamata. see you again. Correct. Yeah. Jamata. Jamata. So instead of instead of sayonara, generally people say jamata. Correct. So this is our next word. So okay, yeah. This is uh good night. Uh for good night, we use uh oyasuminasai. So, I Yasumi, yes, yeah. <laughs> so okay. we say, oh yes. So either you can say for very casual, uh, in casual, you can say, oh yes, me, or if you are saying it in a uh, formal way, you can say, oh yes, me, nasai. Oh yes, me, nasai. Oh yes, me, nasai. Yes. Okay, one more time. Oh yes, me, nasai. Yes, we don't have to stress uh, on O, but yes, uh, the full word is Oyasuminasai. Oyasuminasai. Yes, correct. 
Okay. And also, I would just like to share that here, uh, the one that we see in the starting is a kanji character, which is for uh, you, Yasu. So Yasu, uh, this basically is the character for leave, I think, or maybe taking a break. Yeah. So okay. that is why it is a part of this word. Here, uh, kanji as well as two two script is uh, as an uh, mixed in this word. The first script is uh, kanji, the pictography, and the second from the second one to the last is hiragana. Yes. So, oh yes, Yes, Okay. <laughs> Let's move <laughs> to the next one. Yes. Okay, so uh, the next one is Arigato. Thank you. So we say uh, thank you as Arigato. That is, that arigato. is a casual word. Arigato. Arigato. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, we uh, just forgot to mention in the starting that, you know, uh, whenever you speak somebody's name, they add son after the name just to give them respect. Like maybe here in India, when we take somebody's name, we add something like G or maybe in English, we add Mr. So Mr. Sidhan. So that way in Japanese, if I have to talk to him or anybody else and give them respect, I will say Sidhan son. So everybody that we talk to in our office as well, we used to call their name and then add San to it. So David San, Manit San, Sidhan San, that is how you greet somebody with respect. Yeah, one additional bonus point that I just recorded. <laughs> okay, uh, moving forward. Okay, so uh, like... In casual, we can say we say arigato uh, for thank you, but uh, when we are we have to say uh, in formal way, we can say arigato gozaimasu. Like in school, as in, in when a teacher, when a student uh, talks to a teacher, or we talk in offices, then we call when uh, then we use the expression arigato. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu. Yes. So what we can say, we also did a word, I think, back, which was casual and formal again. I don't remember the word that we just did. And then it was arigato as well. Uh, with When we Ohio. say casual and formal. Yes, Sadan. Yeah, that was the word was Ohio. Ohio and Ohio gozaimasu. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the difference between casual and formal is, I also saw that message from David. He's saying it is getting harder. <laughs> so uh, the difference between casual and formal is that casual is mostly used with your friends or people of your same age or maybe people younger to you but formal is often used with people who are senior to you your elders your teachers your professors everybody who you are learning from and also are elder to you in age if i have explained that correctly the difference yeah, between the correct. casual and formal Ooh, absolutely correct Okay, let's move forward. Yes. Okay, yeah. So this word sumimasen is used for both excuse me and uh, as well as for sorry, for apologizing. So the word is sumimasen. Sumimasen. Sum sumimasen. 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 Correct. Okay, let's move forward. Yeah, okay. So we have covered all the greetings up till now. And now we are moving to phrases and we will also try some phrases. It's not important that you have to, uh, you know, adopt every example that we are sharing, just the main phrase, if you can catch that, it will be really nice. Okay, the first one is the introduction one. So how do we introduce in Japanese? Okay, so... Uh... My name is Siddhan. So I'll say Watashi Siddhant Des. Or Watashi Mami Mamito Des. Mamito Des, correct. Okay. Let's move so, forward. Yeah. Or you can say, or you can just say, instead of uh, saying the full sentence, you can say Siddhant Des is also 
that also works but if you are saying in a somebody in a formal way you can say watashi wa siddhantu this okay yes. uh, siddhant just one question i'm sure everybody would have they understand mm -hmm. watashi that is i they understand a uh, name that is our name manmeet or siddhant but what is this this like why what uh, is why are we using that like this is like am like in english we say i am siddhant so okay. this is is equal to am okay or Got you it. can say my name is so so okay. uh, if you say my name my name is uh, siddhant then the sentence will be watashi no namae wa siddhant des but when you say i am siddhant you say watashi wa siddhant des so uh, when in in that sentence uh, i am i is watashi am is des and uh, siddhant the name comes as it is okay got it did you get it or uh, did i confuse <laughs> no 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 i think it was pretty clear <laughs> okay okay let's move to the next one this i have put this sentence because i like t a lot <laughs> <laughs> okay so okay so uh, here it, uh, we can say ocha ga suki des ocha ga suki des suki is like i like something so ocha ga suki des ocha is tea we uh, this ga is uh, called as particle there is something called particle in japanese so every subject has uh, ka or wa with it so uh, here ocha is the subject of the sentence so ocha ga suki des ocha ga suki des okay <laughs> ocha ga <laughs> dai suki des <laughs> dai suki so, is like i li like a lot so she so said i like uh, tea a lot so two expressions ocha ga suki des i like tea ocha ga dai suki des i really like tea okay let's move really forward to the next one yeah okay so for here we can see uh, for like when we say really the word is honto honto the first can you say it in a uh, japanese accent please how would japanese say honto honto <laughs> once more honto is ka honto so Hanto? the first sorry mm, i was just saying honto yeah honto so the first uh, is written in hiragana the first thing uh, the, in the first sentence it is written in hiragana and the second one is in pictography that is in kanji this uh, it is pronounced as uh, the same honto but it can be written in two different forms in two different this scripts. was just to highlight that how does hiragana change to kanji like when you are writing the same word in kanji how do you actually write that pictography just to represent that Mm -hmm. okay let's move to the next one yeah okay so uh, it is a very useful uh, phrase for anybody who visits japan because <laughs> they don't uh, know english so uh, this will help you whatever place you want to go you can uh, take that name uh, name of the place and then doko desu ka like like earlier i said wa or ga is a subject particle so if you want to say uh, like station i want to go to, uh, where is the station so you can say station wa doko desu ka so and or station can, is wanna... uh, station is eki in japan so eki wa doko desu ka eki wa doko desu ka or you want to say uh, where is toilet you can say in uh, the toilet is uh, english word so in japanese it will be toire so toire wa doko desu ka and what is hotel so, in japanese if i have to say where is hotel where is the hotel so it will be hoteru 
Hotel is also an uh, English word, foreign word for Japanese. So it will be hoteru wa doko desu ka? Okay. And if I have to say, maybe, you know, uh, this is places we are talking about. Let's say if I'm talking about an object, that uh, phone, where is my phone? So how would I say? Or maybe just so, phone. Phone is uh, denwa in Japanese. So denwa wa doko desu ka? Manmito san wa doko desu ka? It will be like that. Uh, so, what was um, here? I forgot. Koko desu. Koko desu. Koko desu. Koko is here in Japanese, yes. And there is a soko. So, so uh, in in English, there is uh, used for, as in, in Japanese, there are uh, like, if you want, if you're talking to a person and if you want to say that uh, this, like I'm talking to you and then I'm saying that the phone is with you. So, so uh, in that case, I, I'll say denwa uh, wa soko desu. But if I want to talk about some some other place or some other thing. Far away. Uh, some, far away from me as well as from you, then I'll say denwa wa asoko desu. That means that is far from me as well as from you. Got it. Got it. Okay, moving forward. So next time when you are in Japan and you want to find out something, you just have to use nani nani wa doko desu ka. Nani nani means any place or anything that you would like to add. And then wa doko desu ka. And you will get your answer. Okay. 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 Uh, let's move forward. So now we have a few resources to share with you uh, because you, you know, this presentation might make you feel like, oh, I want to learn more about the language. I want to know more about the language. So there are different ways uh, to learn Japanese. I am more of a Netflix person. I did my diploma from the school as well, but I have watched a lot of web series. But Siddhant is more of an anime person. He would see a lot of anime. So I think he would share about the anime and then I'll share a few about Netflix. So, so yes, the very famous Netflix, uh, very famous anime is One Piece. You might have heard uh, its name. It's been uh, there since like 1989 probably. It is, and it is still going on. Uh, it, uh, there are more than 900 plus episodes and uh, still, uh, I guess, 200 or 300 more uh, episodes are still uh, remaining. Then uh, the other one you might have heard is uh, like one of my favorite is Hunter x Hunter. Then uh, Demon Slayer. In the, uh, the English word is Demon Slayer, but the Japanese one is uh, Kimetsu no Yaiba. Then uh, another famous one is Death Note. Then a very popular one is Naruto. Yeah. Then Naruto. These are the fa uh, famous ones. Uh, then I guess, yes, uh, a very famous for uh, Western people as well. Or uh, so, as in, is uh, Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball or Dragon Ball Z. Uh, that series is uh, very popular outside Japan as well. What we can so, do is that after this presentation, probably we can create a document with all the links and share it with everyone for them to watch. Okay. There are a lot of shows on Netflix that I keep watching. Uh, now, I don't really remember all their names, but uh, one of them is Flower Boys. I don't remember uh, the name of that series, but there are a lot of names. I don't remember now, but I'll go through my Netflix and check. But I've seen uh, tons of uh, web series on Netflix and I've learned and picked up a lot of language from there, even after learning in my diploma, because this is very important to point out is because if you would want to continue this professionally, then these platforms are not really the best resource to learn professionally because the language they will have is a lot of casual language and maybe at times foul language as well because these are um, web series and entertainment pieces. So any of these languages, if you use in your corporate or professional life, then nobody can save you because Japanese are very professional people and they are really strict with how you speak and what language are you using. You really have to be 
um, attentive enough that how are you speaking to your senior? That is one thing that is in Japan as a culture. Yes, Adhan. By the way, I, yes, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, give you a disclaimer that uh, the language which is used in anime is not at all used in uh, casual life in Japanese, as in, in, in Japan, because uh, that language is very aggressive and uh, extreme kind of, as in, very rude kind of uh, language they use. So please do not uh, use those expression in uh, with any Japanese person. And with that, uh, we also have a professional recommendation. There is a YouTube channel, which is JapanesePod101.com. They have a lot of videos through which you can learn Japanese on a daily basis. And YouTube, of course, is a platform where you can consume information free of cost. So please go ahead. If at all you felt for one moment that you like the language or you would like to give it a try, you can go to this YouTube channel. Even I was learning in my initial days from here. So take the benefit of it and do let us know if you are moving ahead with learning the language. Yes, David. How was, did you like the presentation? <laughs> I was about five minutes in and then you lost me. <laughs> <laughs> it was... It was superb. And it's kind of one of those things, I think, that you need to spend, even though you were showing just a few of the, the phrases and the, the words, it's kind of one of those things you've got to spend quite a bit of time on each each word and get those. those Because the way you say it, uh, Sudan, you're saying it in Japanese way, it's kind of even that's foreign, the way it's pronounced. Uh, and it's not, and because you're using the sim, because you've got the symbols as well, it's like when you write, do you use all symbols or do you write like with the written form, like Honto, or do you write the symbol when you're writing? Oh, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, actually, the language is a mixture of when you write it, all these three scripts are included uh symbols that is kanji then uh hiragana and katagana you include all these three scripts and then you, uh, you need to write as in, then you can go through the language i just thought uh, maybe i'll try with my keyboard and try writing the language to show so i'll write vata shi this is a kanji so then va this is hiragana vata shiva then manmito this is katagana foreign word then this. So <laughs> this is a sentence with all the three scripts, kanji, hiragana, and katagana together. So whichever word is from whichever origin, this is how we write the language. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at that. And this is much easier on the desktop because as soon as I started typing this, I got um, suggestions below, but when you're actually doing it on paper, it's just our mind. So if you don't remember it, it's gone. So like you, you had like, like Honto, for instance, or Aragato, um, Aragato. Yeah. Correct. Um, you, you wouldn't write that as Aragato. You would write it in the Chinese character form. Okay. I will write Ari. Arigato is written as it is. In, in Hiragana. There is no kanji. Uh, yeah, I, there is kanji for it. Okay, is it? But I don't include, know. including, including, uh, as in you uh, include kanji as well as uh, Hiragana and then uh, you combine both the scripts and then uh, Arigato is uh, written. So we always combine the scripts and write it depending upon which script is needed when. I think that's the judgment one who's writing has to take. Am I correct? Yeah. Uh, wait. So and, how uh, how many chance. like because you're using because kanji is words that are not in Japanese. You they you create um, you create picto pictographs of them. Yes. But how if if it's a brand new word, how is that pictogram? How is that? worked out to be pronounced okay uh, so kanji is basically to differentiate two words like i shared in my presentation suppose there is a word called hashi so this is the word hashi 
Now this hashi has two meanings. It also means a bridge and it also means a chopstick. So kanji is required to understand that which one is bridge and which one is chopstick. So this word hashi in hiragana is common. When I write it in different sentences, I will use the kanji of either bridge or either chopstick. Oh, okay. And so... <laughs> Sudhan has also shared the kanji of arigato with me. So this is in kanji. Arigato gozaimasu. Ah. Uh, ah, uh, okay. Yeah. It's um <laughs> this is such a hard language. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. I would admit it. <laughs> It's really difficult to say. Um, this is brilliant. So, sorry, sorry is it done? Yes, yes. Yeah, actually, I was saying that uh, this uh, hiragana and uh, katakana saves us uh, while writing uh, Japanese, but for Chinese people, it is even more difficult that they don't have uh, such uh, phonetical uh, alphabet. So they they have only uh, pictographic. Uh, characters and people have to remember each and every pictography for all oh, the characters <laughs> oh yeah so it's even harder because they've just got that and then they're having to be told and they've got no way to to reference yeah correct so uh, we have a phonetical letters which helps us whenever we don't remember a kanji we can write it in phonetic uh, letter and we can proceed with it but in japanese in chinese it is even more difficult why do why do they, they have, why do they make that so hard? <laughs> <laughs> it's traditional. I guess it's traditional because you see, it's amazing. Like when you see some of the Japanese um, doing all the symbols, um, that is just an amazing art for. Like the calligraphy side of it is just another level. Um, yeah, I've seen some of that stuff and it's just, wow. I've tried to do things myself. And it's just, <laughs> just, just don't. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, right, is because uh, there's no way that I'm going to learn even the <laughs> basics, is I'm just going to take your recording and I'm just going to cut it up and just okay, <laughs> show it to people. <laughs> no, no, David, I have a better answer. Like I said, you can take me along. I'll have you both on speed dial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's absolutely amazing. Are you going to post the um, slide, the the slide deck for people to to grab? Yes, I can okay? do that. I can share it with you and probably we can put it on the tutorial site and give the tutorial site link or anyhow it works. I can share the slide with you. Oh, fabulous. That's brilliant. That's great. So I'm sure um, that people like people are watching, but they're not they're not commenting because it's like they just don't know what they're to still say. Digesting the language. It's it's brilliant. And it's really nice to meet you as well, Sudan. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Same here, same here. Yeah, it's brilliant. We want you on again. You gotta come on again. <laughs> Maybe we'll sure. I'll be I'll be happy to do that. That's good. Maybe you can do you can do our videos with Mami in Japanese for the Japanese marketplace. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a nice idea. That would be good. <laughs> um, cool. No, absolutely fantastic. Thank you guys very much. And uh, yeah, that was a brilliant one. Great. I can't wait to see the feedback happen in the Facebook um, post because there's going to be a lot of uh, comments going on because <laughs> I, I think we got we got quite a few Japanese. Uh, in as instructors so hopefully they'll come in and they'll start uh, commenting as well so it'd be really good and we would if we said correct. anything incorrect so that's <laughs> like <a few> <laughs> they'll be correcting you <laughs> yeah no it's going to be good what i want to do also is i want to snip this part of the video out and i want to put it on the zenda channel as its own thing just to see uh, the interest coming through, because I'll just tag it all in Jap as Japanese. Uh, maybe, Mami, you can mark it up in Japanese and just see if we get any traffic coming through from Japan. Which sure, would, I can do that. Which would be good. But fabulous. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, David. It was a lovely time. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, and good Thank to you. meet you. I love the chemistry. It's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we also enjoyed it a lot. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Right, guys. 
uh, Japanese. Oh, that was so complicated. I um, I got completely lost. I'm no good on languages anyway, so I think it's me. But my little highlight there was uh, Kevin is pronounced Kevin in Japanese. I thought that was a classic. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, such a good one. So now what we have is we have uh, Kirsty going to join us. Uh, we're a few minutes early, so but she might jump in. And um, Kirsty is a new one. We've not had her on a David Zendler before. So I've not met her. This will be the first time I've met her. So I can't wait. And she is also going to follow on a little bit like Howard. Um, she's going to be teaching quite a few different things. Now, I was just chatting to her in the chat. And um, she's also going to say that she's going to cover strategy, social media, webinar, storytelling and technology. It depends how much time um, she can spend. It should be about 40 minutes. Now, normally uh, by 12 o'clock we've finished, but we've added this extra spot in because it is this morning session is all about communication, presentation and all of these things that we think is like such an important part. I know number one pain point for uh, course creators is actually marketing, but communication is the key behind marketing, you know, to be able to communicate clearly, to have really good videos and these sort of things. And so this day is kind of dedicated to that course. We have Andrew in on the afternoon and he's going to be talking about sound. Uh, he's going to be talking about lavaliers. He's going to be talking about desktop mics. You can quiz him. Um, he's going to be giving what to look for when going for, to those things. And then we also have Liz on and Liz is going to be not our Liz, Zenla Liz, uh, new Liz. And she's going to be talking again. She's not been on before. She's going to be talking about Instagram and particularly video Instagram. So video reels. So this is also a really good thing as well. We've got Alice. I don't know what Alice is talking about, but she tends to look at what's going on and then she adapts it to work with what we've got um, going on. As, as it were. So we've got an exciting um, afternoon for sure uh, with these sort of things. So we're going to just waiting for Kirsty to join us. And just before, I just want to go to the link that um, Mammy was putting. She will put a download link in there so you can download the um, slides that she did. She's probably busy doing that now. But if I go to the Japanese site, we've got JapanesePod101.com. So this is the site they were talking about. So guys, if you want to learn Japanese and things, this is a really good um, site to go to to visit and, uh, you know, just to learn all those things you want to learn. And like, you know, you know, I don't have to say to you, but, you know, when you go to a new country, it's always good to try to speak that language, you know, at least on a basic level. So you know, it's always a good thing. So that was Japanese from Mamit and Sidant, her husband. And now we have Kirsty on. So Kirsty, when you're ready, jump up. Hello. You got your mic off. I'm just sorting it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> hello. Just, good. Hello. Good to see you. Ah, oh, I just love it when you come to do a presentation and you're a professional presentation coach. And what goes wrong? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> don't, you know, don't worry about that. It's that's what happens when you go live. You know, that we, you have is how you handle it, isn't it? It's how you handle it. That. Absolutely. You know. I have had the worst incident ever happen when I was doing a, a podcast and my guest didn't. My guest turned up and there was no video, only audio. Ooh. yeah so and, and and we got through it and they had to take a three minute break so yes things will go wrong and you just have to ride that curve and you just have to make it work for you yeah yeah and it's part of I, I think in some ways it's I mean we want everything to go smoothly and all the way through but when things do happen it just shows the human side because like if you're doing lots of these all the time, you're going to have technical issues. You're going to have problems. And it's how that you can handle those and get through them. Um, how, you know, I've had streams where they've just stopped. And like last one I did was actually with Angela, Angela Sundust. And my, uh, I had a power cut. So it just cut everything off. And she was on on her own. And she was like, oh, but she carried on. 
you know and that's like you if i was to cut off you would just go and roll with it because you're used to doing this stuff but some people just panic and they're like ah <laughs> i have a tip for that and i'm going to talk about that during the presentation so there are some lots of little gems in the presentation for people to take away today because Fabulous. why would i do it if i wasn't going to share something that is of value and really really unique so yeah this is good so uh Kirsty, i'm gonna let let you introduce yourself have a little chat about yourself and then you can just run with the thing if you need me to come up just shout my name and i can just pop up um if not please feel free, feel free to interject if you want to with questions it won't throw me um i'd like you you know the, the more interactive this is the better it is the more you will get out of it the more learning you will take away today so feel free to interject particularly if we get to a point where maybe the chat's going i don't know what she means particularly if we get into the tech stuff do ask the questions it's really important yeah i, I try to um i try to ask, ask questions that a lot of people would ask so i might be throwing questions in to you to just get your feedback on it so that's what I'll do. If you if you want if you're saying you need questions and things like that, I can just pop up. But for now, I'm going to hand you over to Kirsty, and it's so good to meet you as well. I know we've been chatting via the chat all the time, but it's really nice to have you on here. So take it away, Kirsty. No problem. So, do you want to speak with confidence on video using your key messages, be on brand, and be succinct? Yeah. Well, guess what? I'm Kirsty Vanderbilt and I am a video marketing strategist and on camera coach. And that is a really different thing that we're going to cover today. We are going to cover the strategy behind your video. We're also going to look at what makes camera confidence important and also the technology, because my goodness, how many of you look at it and go, yeah, I don't know where to start. You put into a search engine and you're searching for that information and you are lost. There's a myriad of information out there and it's confusing. More importantly, I'm going to help you understand why storytelling makes a difference on video. But firstly, why do I have the right to sit here today and tell you all about how to be confident on camera or how to use solid marketing strategy in your video? Well, for over 10 years, I worked as a sales coach. And before that, I was a professional actress. And more importantly, I was you. I was born mute. I couldn't speak. Well, I wasn't mute. I had a speech impediment. And that speech impediment really gave, gave me issues until I was about four and a half. Like you, I had to find my voice. I had to go through speech therapy and through speech therapy, which I hated. And if you listen carefully, I've got a speech impediment. So that's fine. I went into drama and I ended up being a professional actress. But like many professional actresses out there, you have to survive. So I worked in retail. I worked teaching sales technique. Te technique. See, I made a mistake. Did I fluster? No, you accept these mistakes. I will come on to aim later. That's me planting the seed. You see, I'm already talking about sales strategy. The planting the seed is when we want to bring something up that is important and we plant the seed. Why did I start my video with a hook? Why didn't it come in and say, hi, I'm Kirsty? Because you've got three seconds to make an impact and those three seconds really count and don't waste it saying hello. So back to why I have the right. When I ran channel comms for really high end uh, ma manufacturing companies. So if you look at my LinkedIn, you will find out who they are, but I'm not gonna bring them in today because it's not relevant. So during this, I'm gonna talk about public speaking and public speaking on camera and why it is different and it is different. So a great public speaker out there who's got years of training may not be as good on camera as you. So stop worrying about it. We're going to cover the rhythmic voice. Now I know there's been a lot of stuff about breathing, but I'm going to bring in the rhythmic voice because it's important. And if you use my aim, back to that seed, we will be able to use it and reset and start again if we are in our rhythmic voice. We're going to cover off storytelling. We're going to cover off words, preparation, the principles for success, common mistakes, and tech choices. So you ready to come on the ride? Because I'm going to rock your on-camera presence. So as I said, what is public speaking on camera? Well, it's every time you speak on camera. 
is every time you do a video for social media, is every time you do an advert for your course, it's every time you come to present on camera. So that's on a tablet, it's on a mobile, it's on the, your laptop, but everything you do needs to work in the same format because people are watching you and only you. So you're not talking to the masses, you're talking to one person. And before you even start talking, you really need to think about how your message, what you are saying would land on you. So you must step into your audience's shoes. Now, a lot of people will talk about your ideal customer, your avatar. I'm gonna tell you, put yourself in your shoes and look at yourself externally. It sounds really crazy, but trust me, read your copy that you were writing for a post. Read your copy on your website as if you were reading it for the very first time and be transparent. Make yourself easy to work for. Video will build the know, like and trust. And with 80% of a sales decision made before anybody even talks to you, video really, really rocks. Wear bright colours. Today I'm wearing a pink. Pink looks great on camera. You want to do anything you can to catch the attention because you are going to advertise your course on social media, so you've got to be seen. So how do we do this? What are the foundations for success for being succinct on brand and on message on camera? Well, let me, into, let, me let you into a secret. It's exactly the same as your copy. How do you start your copy? Do you start it with, good morning, I'm going to do, no. You start your blog, you start your copy with a big bang of a hook because you wanna draw your customer in. So you hook them, them in, it needs to be succinct. Now let me talk about how the world has changed. The pandemic changed the way we communicate. Today, we type into a search engine what we are looking for using keywords, our SEOs. You need to use your search engine optimization in your hook. You need to be powerful. You need to be strong and you need to grab that attention. So if we look just at social media for now, social media is fast. You have to be accurate. You have to be concise and it has to be true. Now, when I say true, it has to be your truth because you must stand by your word. Let's talk about energy before we go a bit further. There's lots of coaches out there that will tell you to bring lots and lots of energy to the screen. The problem with that, and I said screen instead of screen, lots and lots of energy. The problem with that is you're going to be moving. And if you are on a webcam like I am today, your webcam, if it's got its autofocus on, is going go out of focus. So think about limiting your movement. And remember, you are limited by the size of your shot. So if you're doing something over there, well, the audience aren't going to see that. So again, think about the shot. Now, there's lots of things out there on YouTube where we can discuss what shot you're in. Today, I am in what they call a medium close up. So that is in shot with my head. And I don't have a background because backgrounds can be distracting. So there's lots of things that we're going to talk about. So limited by the size of the shot, the more you do, the more it's for the audience, because the audience are watching you. And if they're watching you and you're really busy or you're wearing a stripy top or you're dancing all over the place, which is great, by the way, for a reel, but for content, they're going to move on because their brains can't take it. You have overloaded their senses. So back to step into your audience shoe and look and see how you are coming across. Look at if you would watch that video, would you sign up to that person? Because if you wouldn't, then your audience won't. Voice and words. You must use your voice. If we are to talk in a monotone, we are going to go away. Talking about which, ditch the script. Stop using a script because a script will limit your creativity. A script will turn you into a robot. I have not scripted this. I have a deck that I am following. I have not scripted it. And on that note, I have just put the deck up there on Yuzenla for you today. So it's not the best lead magnet, but there it is for you so you can download them. Before you start, which is really important, you need to have a positive mindset. You need to know you can and you will. And I'm gonna tell you, anybody can and will speak on, on camera. I have had clients that are absolutely petrified and it is really important to remember that you know you, 
you do you and nobody does you better than you and more importantly nobody knows what you're going to say on camera so why are you worrying about it and if you are worrying about it are you worrying about what you look like are you worrying about that spot on your chin because if you are stop it because I'm going to tell you a secret I don't watch myself back I listen to check I'm on message and on brand but I don't watch myself back and the reason I don't watch myself back is because an actor doesn't have that luxury. When I was in the BAFTA award-winning dramas, we did not have the luxury to look at the tape, look at the take. So if I didn't look at the take then, why am I looking at the take now? The only thing I want to know is I'm on message, on brand, and that it's going to resonate. And it's going to resonate by using positive, empowering, emotive words. So really think about positive, powerful, emotive words. Now, before you start, you check your tech. You check your camera is working. You check your vlogging kit is all set up. You check your microphone. Then you hit record. And you know what? You may just be a one take wonder because they do happen. But because you're thinking it's going to be harder than that, you're looking at the 50th or the 60th take. And actually, you probably nailed it in the first one. So again, stop overthinking, stop limiting, stop judging because the only person who's stopping you from posting or creating that course or going and speaking on camera is you. So step into your audience, listen and think, would it resonate for me? Am I on brand? Am I on message? Am I doing it succinctly? If it's a tick in all of those, post, get on and do it. Stop overthinking. So just some of the things that I really feel very, as you might have gathered, passionate about. So. The rhythmic voice. Every single person who is born has heard two things in their life. Two things. From the very moment that you can hear, you hear your breath. Well, actually, you hear your mother's breath and you hear the heartbeat. Now, this is a secret rhythm and it's the secret rhythm that Shakespeare wrote in. It's called the iambic pentameter and it goes to dum. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Now, when you get nervous and you get excited, we go out of our rhythm and we go, uh, 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 and we go all over the place. Well, actually, take a breath and acknowledge that you are nervous. Listen and grab your wrist. If you can't feel your heartbeat on your wrist, put your hand behind your ear and just feel and take breaths in to your heartbeat. Now you can do this on camera because you can touch your wrist out of shot. You can do it when you're public speaking because you can look like you're scratching your ear. You can do it a lot of times and it will help you. Now if you're really nervous and you're not getting into your natural rhythm, then what you do is you take a deep breath in, you look down, you cheat the camera, you lift your eyes up, you smile like the Cheshire Cat, you think less and you start again because if we acknowledge we are nervous. If we identify we are nervous and we're nervous because we're in a situation that is unusual, we can grab those nerves, we can own those nerves, and we can move on. And that is my seed, that is aim, and that is my gift to you. Acknowledge, identify, and move on. We can acknowledge we are nervous. We can acknowledge we are scared. We can identify where that emotion is coming from and we can move on. More importantly, we can use that reversed in our videos. We can acknowledge that our customer is gonna be nervous or our customer is in need of your product. We can identify the benefit of that product and then we can move on because when I go back, 80% of a sale is now made before any human interaction. And if you've got that number to think about, video is the most powerful way to build your know, like, and trust. Whether it's for your course creation, whether it's for your social media, whether it's for your website, whether it's for a webinar, it doesn't matter. The point is you still need to be on brand, on message, and you need to show how you serve. Stop selling. We're not interested in selling and that is where your story comes in. So storytelling. Why a story? Well, a story is something we know. 
A story is something that we have heard back to that rhythmic voice, back to being a little child. We have heard a story. Storytelling has been alive and around for years. Go back to the Native American Indians and there's always the storyteller. Stories are passed on from generation to generation and they always have a beginning, a middle and an end. And through that beginning, middle and end arc, you will find lots of little bits of information. Just like the presentation I'm doing today, I put a story to it. I planned a journey to keep you entertained as I explain how to speak on brand, using your key messages and be, being succinct and using it in a fast, accurate, concise and true manner. So there's lots of different things in there. So always, always wrap a story. Now, a lot of the time I hear, what makes a good story? Well, actually, you do. You make a brilliant story because you are you. Oh, here we are again. You know you and you do you and nobody does you better. So you have had experiences in your childhood. Those experiences shaped you and made you who you are. The successes, the failures, the highs, the lows, the same successes and failures that you had in your childhood that you may have experienced or different ones in your teenage years are also how you have shaped, how you have grown. If you go right back to the very beginning of this presentation, I talked about why I had the right to sit here today. And that's because I was an actor. That's because I worked in retail. That's because I was a sales trainer. And that's because I worked in channel sales. So there you get an overarching picture of how a story works. I even talked about my childhood, about how I was born with a speech impediment. I didn't talk about how I went to a theater-based school at 11, but there you go. My teenage years were spent training as an actor. So I've now covered and shown you what makes a great story you do. But how do I get there? What is the successful way to create a story that will always work? Got a really good secret for you. Stanislavski's seven questions. You ask you, your, yourself these questions before you write or go on camera. The reason I use Stanislavski's seven questions is because I was an actor and I'm trained in Stanislavski technique. So it makes sense to me. Now, Interesting fact, Stanislavski trained Meerholt. Meerholt is responsible for breaking the fourth wall. You can go and read it. There'll be other theatre practitioners that say that, but Meerholt did it. And right now, I'm breaking the fourth wall. So everything that I am talking about is relevant today, even though it was written in the 1800s. So Stanislavski's method is seven questions. You ask, who am I? Where am I? What do I want? When do I want? Why do I want? How will I get it? What do I need to overcome to get what I want? That is your seven questions. Now, if you think about it, sorry, I run around the last two together. So what do I need to overcome to get what I want? No, I didn't. That's just my bad reading. So here you go. You've got seven questions. But how do you turn that into a personal framework story? I, 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 so for a personal one, we would, instead of who am I, we would go with a hook. We would then introduce yourself. You would then say why you are here, why you are able to tell your story. Is this going back over how my presentation started? You would talk about story situations, the problem or the pain. Sounding familiar? I've talked about fear. I've talked about aim, how you solve the problem or the pain and what you have learned to make you who you are. And I'm still get to get, I'm still to get to how you solve the problem or pain. How does this work? Do how do you use it for work? Again, it's a hook. It's introducing yourself. It's the company and the role. So your company and your role. You get your pro, the, your chosen product and you add and you identify the problem, the benefits, and how the benefits of your pro your product will solve the pain. Now, there's a lot of people who don't like the word pain, and I totally agree. Pain is a really, really horrible way of selling. So we go back to we're not serving, we're not selling, we are serving. So if we're not serving, 
sorry, if we're not selling and we are serving, then what we have to do is we have to show how the benefit of our product solves and makes someone's life easier. And this is exactly what you're doing in your copy. This is exactly what you're doing in your posts. This is exactly what you're doing when you are creating a course on whatever subject you are doing it on. You are taking somebody on a consumer journey. So if you're not in, back to the shoes of your audience, if you are not standing and looking at what you are doing without thinking about how it will land, you are giving yourself a lot of work because you don't know. You have to look at your work objectively. So hopefully that gives you an idea of a foundation and the conclusion, the next step. So hopefully that is a really lovely way and you can springboard onto other stories. So Stanislavski has seven questions. Who am I? Where am I? What do I want? When do I want? Why do I want it? How will I get it? What do I need to overcome to get what I want? Those are the seven questions. And if you can turn that into a format, and as I said, this will be ready for a download, you've got an opportunity to really make your video content constantly rock every time you post. Waffle and words. Negative words add weight. Negative words stop a connection. Just using the word negative right now, I bet some of you are going, oh, oh, I don't like that. So I'm going to stop using that word and we're going to talk about how that will equal inaction. So when somebody is listening or watching, remember, 90% of the time when you are presenting on camera, people are listening and not watching. I bet you right now, some of you are typing busy doing something else on the other screen as you've got me in one ear. So using positive, powerful words without waffle is really key to getting your message across. Negative words turn people away from you as soon as you put them out there. The word selling, it's gone. Pain, gone. Just, you're never a just, you are. So you must be strong and it goes back to that hook, come in strong come in loud, come in proud, stand out, be strong, be succinct. So back to fact, everything is fast, everything is accurate, everything is concise, and everything must be your truth. So positive emotive words will allow a connection. You know, I'm scared to present on camera. That's okay, I get it. Um, I am feeling overwhelmed by writing copy because I'm not a content writer. I get it. So we use the words that will resonate. So we empower people and will open up the creativity. More importantly, it will create a connection and empathy with your audience. So if you're listening or reading your copy back and you realize that what you're saying doesn't actually resonate in an emotive way, then it's time to start again. It really is that simple. You must use positive, empowering emotive words and get rid of the buts because but negates everything you've said before the justs you've just qualified who you are and you don't need to be strong because you know you you do you and you know you better than anybody else you can see where we're going so preparation i think we're going to finish this much quicker than i, I anticipated preparation mindset yeah the big one you have to believe you can. And even if you don't believe you can, just do it because you can delete it. It doesn't matter if it, you get it wrong. It doesn't matter if you say the wrong word. It doesn't matter because actually the percentage of people who see your content is really small. And yet in our heads, it's huge. It's a bit like when that wasp flies in the room and you hear the buzzing, you think it's this huge thing. And actually the wasp is about that big. And yet we built it into that big, big, huge flying insect that we are petrified of being stung by. Use and be in the right mindset. You are not looking for perfection. Perfection does not exist. Perfection is a moving target and we will never catch up to it. You have no idea how many times I have posted a video that is full of ums and ahs. In fact, I created one deliberately about ums and ahs because there's a technique to get around it. Now, this technique's really cool. 
what you can do is you visualize your story. So as you are telling your story to the camera, you visualize it in your head, you see the images and pictures, and you place somebody you love behind the camera lens. You are talking to them. You're not talking to me. You are, but you're talking to somebody you love. You're talking to the person that is your number one fan. And you're talking to that person because when somebody watches your video, it's one person you're talking to. When somebody reads your copy, it's one person you are talking to. You're not talking to the many, you're talking to one. So start thinking about the one person, start talking through the camera. And as we're talking about talking through the camera, don't eyeball the lens. Please look away. Looking away shows thought. Looking away shows that you actually care. And if you were to sit and have a cup of coffee with a friend in a coffee shop, would you eyeball them? No. Don't shout down the lens. Give space. The camera likes space around you. And as we're on this, we quickly touch about backdrops. Backdrops are great. David is using one. You do need to put a green screen behind it because they will pixelate. The more you move, the more they will pixelate, particularly if you've got um, lights on you. And we'll talk about lighting in a minute. But if you are going to use a backdrop, make sure you've invested in a green screen and you can get green screens secondhand really, really, really affordably. So don't go on camera and put a blur on or put a backdrop on unless you've got a green screen behind it. Before you present, you must take that breath. And I know there's been lots of talk about breath today, but you must take that belly breath. And that is pulling up from giving yourself enough space. So pulling up from the sternum, giving yourself the space and pushing out that belly breath so that you are in and centered. I always say, get your feet to terra firma, place them firmly on the ground saying that right now, I'm sitting cross-legged. But the idea is that you know that you are rooted. You need to feel that you are you. And it back to, you know your story and you do you, you better than anybody else. You must breathe you must smile. And then once you've thought, lights, camera, action, then you hit record. It really is that simple. And if it goes wrong, you go, oh, that was terrible. Delete. If you waffled and you didn't like it, you go, ah, that was terrible. Delete. If you go live, did you know you can still delete it? You don't actually have to leave it up there. I go live every Friday during term time. There are points where I go, oh, did I really say that? You can always edit. Do you know what? Sometimes it's fun to make the mistakes because the mistakes make you human. And back to that 80%, people buy from people. They 80% is done before they interact with you. They have looked at your socials. They've looked at your website. They have looked at every single place that you are. So making mistakes all right. So give yourself permission to make a mistake. <laughs> Talk about mistakes, common mistakes eyeballing the lens. Can you imagine if I was to do this whole presentation directly at the lens looking at you? Now, thankfully, I've actually got a wide angle lens, so this probably isn't too bad. But if I was to do that down a mobile phone or in a webcam, which has only got a, a small angle, a fixed angle lens, I would be screaming at you. So do not eyeball the lens. Get your camera at eye level. Now, there are copious amounts of devices out there. The system I'm using right now is a gooseneck mount. It is snaking around my screen. So my screen is actually to the right of me and behind the camera. And I'm talking to you guys down the camera lens. So get your lens at eye level. You do need good audio. Investing in good audio will make a difference. I use a mic, I won't say the name, but I use a mic that has gain control. The reason I'm using gain control is because I'm in a space that's quite echoey, but I have a separate speaker system. And the reason I have that is because I'm wireless and wires kind of get in the way. Plus, they can create more noise. The gain control will eliminate some of the background noise. So your space. Currently, I'm sitting here with light flooding in from my window. So that's in front of me. I have a light above my camera lens and I also have a light to the right of me. So we do need to cheat the lighting when it comes to presenting. Now there are vlogging kits out there. They usually come with a light. I'm not a fan, I'm gonna say it. I'm not a fan of ring lights unless you are a makeup artist, a hairstylist or, a food, or you're advertising some type of food. The reason for it is ring lights are there for perfection 
and they will put a little ring in your lens. I actually have LED lights and the light above my lens is really cheap. It's just a desktop light. So you do not need to spend a fortune. The reason I've got this lighting system is because I'm flooded from two screens in front of me. If you're using a laptop, put your laptop on a laptop stand, out best inner light to go above the laptop, and you, or alternatively just put it up in books, but get your device at eye level. You need to clear your space. If you're not going to use a backdrop, then clear your space. Now you can cheat your camera angle, but make sure your space is clear of clutter. Make sure that you are the focal point of your presentation. You do not want all that distracting noise going on. Clear it, make it simple, make it clean. And the reason for this, the more you do on camera, the more you bring in, the more it is for your audience to take on board, the more likely you are to give your audience a migraine. So, Less is more. And there's a lovely story about less is more. So Jack Lemon was filming Sun Like It Hot. And Billy Wilder said to Jack Lemon, as he was taking a take, Jack do less. And Jack got really upset and he went off, but he did less because Jack was an actor and he did less and he kept going on. This went on for quite some time. And eventually Jack Lemon turned to Billy Wilder and said, Billy, if I do anything less, I'll be doing absolutely Nothing. And Billy Wilder said, yep, exactly. Now you can check that story out. I've obviously paraphrased it a little bit, but it's really key. Less is more on camera. The less you do, the more impact you will have, which is why I am not bringing the slides in because then I go into a little box. Now they're talking about that. There is software out there that if you don't want to use a green screen, you can use some really good software, which will allow you to bring the, the, the video in, it will allow you to bring in your presentation, or you can do text overlay. There's lots of options out there, and there are lots of choices. Today, I decided I would just be on camera. So delivery, I'm probably guilty of this one, talking too fast, because I was quite excited about coming on here. So talking too fast, pausing. Let's touch pausing on camera. You cannot pause on camera. The reason you cannot pause on camera is people will go, you're on mute, you've stopped talking, is your camera frozen? All of those things. So what you do is go back to that iambic pentameter, back to that rhythmic voice. What you do is you break the rhythm. And I've done that quite a few times in this presentation when I want to land something like mindset common mistakes. Instead of staying in my natural rhythm, I've broken it to make my point. So you break that rhythm to make your point. Content. If you don't prepare, and I am not talking about doing a script, if you don't prepare mentally, and that mentally is making sure you've run through your presentation, making sure you know what you're gonna say, making sure you've got a story arc of where you are going, you know the points you want to land, that does not mean scripting it. So you need to make sure you do that. You need to introduce your say in a way that grabs somebody. And that does mean on camera, starting with your hook. Because honestly, if you start, good morning and welcome. Hello, I'm going to talk about, and I do this a lot, you need to come in strong, particularly if you're doing a webinar or you're doing a course or you're selling that course or you're showing how that course will serve. Because without that, you've already lost them. So if you're gonna do a course on perfect copywriting, it's like copy, perfect writing, I've got you. Some, I'm not saying that's the right way, but something that is in your style, that is unique to you, that will grab the attention. And if you're a copyist, you already know how to write that. So now you've just got to say it. Principles for success. Follow your competitors. Now, not many people will say that, but go look at what they do. Look at what they do and see if you can do it your way. See what you don't like. Do what you do like and see how maybe even, goodness forbid, collaborate with them. Because you know what? Your competitors are there. They're also experiencing the same issues. But go and see what they're doing. Do follow your competitors. Disrupting the market is an interesting one. Don't go out to shock unless you want to. Always make sure that if you're going to disrupt the market, it's on message. 
it's on brand and it's aligned to your brand standards. I did this recently. In fact, I did this this week on a reel, um, something I never do. I started singing deliberately to show that it's about being seen. Stand out, be seen, wear a, wear a bright colored top. Make sure you are seen. You can disrupt the market without being um, contentious. So yes, go out and disrupt the market. When I started, I started with public speaking on camera is not the same as public speaking because at the time in the market, a lot of on-camera coaches had come from the public speaking sector and they were saying, talk down the lens. And it was really annoying me. So that's a truth because they have to stand by what I say. So you can disrupt the market, but make sure you're not doing it to show off or to be contentious. Bring interview questions. So if you're doing a live stream interview and you don't know what the answer is, there's a really good technique to go, that's a really good question. Let me think about that. That's a really good question. Do you know what? How would you feel if you, if you did turn the question back? Give yourself time to think. This is really, really important in job interviews as well, because nowadays camera success is not just about social media. It is not just about creating a video for your website and it is not about just course creation or presenting the best webinar. It is much more, much more is being transacted over video, including your quarterly business review. So if you don't know the answer to the question, turn around and go, that's a really good question. Let me think about it. Or what would you do? Turn the question back if you don't know. Give yourself time. You do not want to end up being pilloried for getting something wrong, particularly in a live stream interview situation. So always, always give yourself time. And the big success, the biggest success of all is be you. And back to you do you. You know you. And you do you better than anybody else technical choices we're going to get a bit messy here but and this is where i expect questions 720p is all you need you do not need to shoot in high definition my webcam is 720p recording actually at 60 frames per second but 30 frames per second is enough and the reason for it is you are putting lots of data down your pipe if you're using a webcam. Anything over an, over a two, three megapixel camera, you can go higher. My megapixel camera is seven. So anything with a decent megapixel camera will be enough. You do not need to go and buy lots of kit. You need to make the decision over wired or wireless. Now the problem, and there is a problem when it comes to doing live stream, if you want to do a live stream wireless, you are going to issue potentially have issues with the pipe. And I'm talking about your network. I'm talking about the, the, the internet here. I'm going technical because you really want to keep that signal solid and you want to use and be hardwired. And if you are going to stream, you probably want to invest in a streaming platform just to make sure that it is seamless and easy for your guests. So you have to look at your file formats and you have to look at your software and you have to look at your editing software. There's a myriad of editing software out there. Find something you are comfortable with. I know the ones that I use and I recommend and I do have a tech list. I stick with them because they are easy. I'm a dyslexic, dyspraxic, and I wanted something that I could use and pass on to non-technical customers that was easy and intuitive to use. I've already talked about why I prefer LED softbox lights over ring lights. And I've really talked about why you should invest in a good separate mic and um, speaker system and why you should have a, a speaker, a, no, a microphone with gain control. I actually use a little conferencing system at my desk because then I am, as I said, I'm totally wireless. And then the decision is, are you gonna record on your mobile? Are you going to record on your laptop? Are you going to record on a tablet? Are you going to use a proper SLR? Those are the choices that you have to make and make sure you get your camera at eye level. So that's me, folks. David, you are welcome to come back in and ask your questions. Hi, Kirsty. That was great. There was some great tips in there. Um, I have a few questions. I have quite a lot. Now, I know stuff goes into the group. So um, if people tag you, tag Kirsty, 
then she'll see that in the group. She can answer questions going forwards. But I do have a few questions for you because you raised quite a lot of really good points. And, you know, we had Howard on this morning, this morning. So he was talking, but you were talking like in general about lots of different things, include, including how you go about and what you should be doing for those social, uh, social media site channels that you're using. So all that information is gold dust. And you covered a lot there. Yeah, I, do. <laughs> I, mean, I did try to you know, say 38 minutes and I think we did yes, <laughs> then stop <laughs> which is brilliant but it was all nice did you see also like the, what I love is like when you see you see people like Kirsty that have been doing this a long time you can tell straight away you can just look at how professional she is like she said mentioned not scripting i don't script anything what i do do is probably exactly what kirsty does and i just have bullet points i just have a deck that i go through i can just glance across and move on to the next one and that's how you storyboard it out so you should be able to talk about the subject because you should know it inside out so any just one word it on a bullet and you should be like right okay i can talk about that for 10 minutes and you can time it so if you're working like kirsty was probably looking down at the clock looking down looking at the bullets making sure she's going enough to cover one area but being slightly quicker with the other area because she knows she's going to finish at a set time then you you do that as well but that's something that comes with experience so you can start simply to start with maybe have five bullet points or three just cover those see how long that took you see if you could have expanded it you don't have to do that live you could record it so you could say right i'm going to try and do three bullet points and i'm going to do it for half an hour and then you can say right i'm going to do the same three bullet points and i'm going to do it for 10 minutes and see if you can and that way you'll be really quick at being able to expand or compress or stay on those points i think that's a really good exercise that you can use before you've even gone live you know, I'm sure like it's really good, though, Kirsty, because it's like all actresses and actors there. Uh, they're all like really good at this stuff. You know, they can just like they don't script. They just roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, um, I'm going to say I used to script, but when I went into business. I made that mistake because as an actor, I'd always learned scripts and doing that change and I think it's really important people know doing that change from being an actress where everything was scripted to learning to actually be on brand be on message and be succinct took time people always think that you get here immediately you don't um I didn't record my first social media video until oh February last year and I've removed my first five because on on my YouTube channel because they are yeah, the quality wasn't great and and I've redone them and and it 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 doesn't happen overnight it doesn't you're not a one-off wonder on camera it takes time and it took me I was doing a presentation for my old company and I'd scripted it and it was like I sat there going why have I scripted this and I ripped thankfully I ripped the script up but I really want to put it out there that if you have been scripting it's okay I'm just going to say that you don't need to. It's just about finding the inner confidence. And that's why I kept repeating the you know you, because nobody knows you better than you do. But it's OK to make a mistake. Yeah, it's um, the, the problem I have with scripts is that it can sound very mechanical. It's like you've written it, you pre prepared it and it's like you're just uh, saying a menu and then it doesn't come across. It's and it's it's really your subject is if i was talking about a subject i could pretty much talk about most things but if i was talking about a subject that i was uncomfortable with it would really come across on camera but guys you know what you're talking about is something that you are an expert in you should not you should be so comfortable in your niche environment to be able to just like any question comes in i can deal with that i you know and that's like that's how you should feel about your subject if you if you don't because you're not an expert in your subject that's a different thing and it will come across so you got to be really careful with that you need to if you are learning a new subject you need to make sure that you are getting to that expert level you need to make sure that any questions that are thrown at you you'll have an answer for you know but like Kirsty was saying it's okay to make mistakes and there's a phrase 
that I learned years and years ago is that people that do nothing make no mistakes. And it's as simple as that. So if you get people and you get them all the time criticizing, saying that's wrong, this wrong, how you find that they don't do anything? But they point out you and you're being so productive. And it, it, it's one of those things and you watch for it. You're like, I don't care. You know, try not to get hit up if someone says something's wrong, because it's like, really, they don't matter. You know, as long as you're satisfying the people that are interested in what you're talking about, that's all you care about, it, in my opinion. So quite <laughs> right. So I've got some questions for you, Kirsty, so before we move on. Right. So how do you plan uh, for a video? So if you're planning something, how do you plan it? How do you go about? So it's uh, one subject, three points. <laughs> it's a, as simple as that, because you start with your hook. So like you would your copy, I start with my hook. Then I have the emotive hook. So statement, emotive hook. Sometimes I go into a, a little bit of information about a bit more. So for instance, um, are you afraid to public speak on camera? Have you tried using a script and found that you sound like a robot? We've all been there and it's okay because we're human. So fear, face everything and rise is something that we can all overcome. I have helped how I serve. I have helped over 20, in the last 20 years, I have helped copious amounts of business people and actors learn to speak with confidence on camera. If you want to know more, get in touch. So the basic thing, I think the video I did this week, and you can see it's a reel, it's it's very short. I started it with singing, uh, which I don't normally do. So um, I started it to, and I, I sang two lines from a song. I went, did I get your attention? Awesome. Social media is fast, accurate, concise, and true. So sometimes it's about doing, it. it is about that hook. And then it's about your message, your key message, and then it's about your call to action. So we're talking about call to action. You don't always have to put a call to action in your video. Sometimes I sign mine off with another top tip coming soon <laughs> because it's not always about selling. And I think people forget it's you are selling in a video, but it's actually about what, how you serve. So identify, do you want an R on camera? Guess what? We all are an R on camera and it's okay. So again, it's starting with that hook. You don't come in with a hello, you hook, emotive hook, how you serve, call to action, if you want it, or a sign. Yeah. Perfect. And notice that it's really short. It's like a minute, three minutes, you know, so really quick. So these, you know, if you're working in that kind of way, you can produce a lot of content. Do you reuse your content, Kirsty, for different social platforms? Of course I do. The, the singing video has gone out on TikTok as a straight video. It went out on Instagram with a funny, stupid, sorry, not stupid, a funny, uh, that was a bad word, a funny, um, yeah, cartoon uh, filter because you can. I haven't put it onto, I did put it on Facebook. Uh, all my content is reused. I either reuse it or if it's not appropriate for YouTube, then I won't put it on YouTube, but everything is reused. I even just rebrand um, some of my images. So I take bits from my blog and you can see those. I take words out of my blog and I put them on there. So everything I do, there is not one bit of content I have not reused. Yeah, and uh, that's a really important note because you will have noticed guys that are watching this, like over the last sort of two months, we have gone on about reusing content. You know, we've we've had it in lots of the workshops. We've talked about it all the time on Zen pop-ups and things like that. So again, that that's what you do. That's how you do it. You reuse the content and you can just um, have a lot more content for that. So the other question I've got for you, Kirsten, I've got tons of questions. I'm going to need you back on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you come up with relevant and possible trending content? Your competition. I said, follow your competition. Follow your competition and see what your competition's, and this sounds really awful, but it's not. See what your competition's uh, audience are asking. 
If you follow them, you will see what they're asking. That will tell you what their concerns are. That way you know how to shape your content. If you're sitting there thinking, and, and this is the other thing, you've got your key messages, you've got your 12 pillars, you've got, you know what you are going to do for your, your, 12, uh, your 12 months. You stick with them, you repeat them, you've got your SEO, so you've got your words that you put into the back of your website or the words you use. Though That actually becomes your content. So you'll see I've done um, speak with confidence on camera. Public speaking on camera is different to public speaking. You'll see um, video marketing content strategy. Those are the things that I constantly talk about. Reusing your content, um, upscaling, shifting. I mean, the, the freebies, they're all reused. They're all, all repurposed because they've all come from a video that I've created or a social media post or something I've asked for. So one, listen, active, not listen, active listen there's a difference between listening and active listening so active listen to your customers problems that will give you one bit of content look at what your competitors are doing and look at what the questions and answers are coming up in even in a group in your facebook group there will be stuff that comes up and you can go oh i can answer that and i ask people i say what do you need a video on Tell me what's not in my 40 plus videos and I will create a video uniquely for you because your problem will be someone else's. Yeah, and that's that's exactly what I do for the Zen pop-ups. I look through the Facebook questions and I'll do a video on it because they've come up with it. So one, they're happy because they've got a video on it. Two, I'm happy because I'm reusing that content on our social channels which has just got tagged with the, you know, all the right keywords in there and that are driving traffic into the platform. So that's how you do it. It's just you make one thing work for all. I call it a circle of profit where I'm doing something. I'll give an example of that is I will do a course on a project that I've contracted to to do as a job. So I'm getting paid from the contractor. I'm also turning that into a tutorial that I can sell as an online course. That's the very tip of it. That's exactly what this course is. So this is my B Camera Confident webinar, and I got asked to present it. I got asked by a LEP to do it, so I did it, and then I've tweaked it, and I've tweaked it, and I now sell this. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> you haven't spent any more time of your life, and you've got something else that's long-term sellable, uh, as well as being paid for it at the same time. So it's like the perfect storm. This, and I try and overlap. What I do is I get a circle and I start overlapping the circles. Like, can I then produce that same thing, change it very, very slightly and sell that as a poster or something like that? Those sort of things or put it on a T-shirt. So then you've got these overlapping circles that are just one big circle of profit coming off of minimal work that you spent in the first place. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's the key to it, guys. You know, uh, more questions for you. Got more <laughs> questions. Uh, I love the fact you were mentioning about storytelling and that no one knows better themselves than themselves. Uh, that's fabulous. And we have had two storytelling challenges. Mamie's run them. So I'm so glad you brought that up there, Kirsty, because it backs up that we're doing a good job with our challenges. <laughs> I did get told about that on the way back from the physio this morning. And I was like, ah, yeah, it's, it's in there. Because what um, I call this webinar is a top-down look at everything. It's not going in depth, but it's a top-down look at success on video. So the, you know, these are all elements that you can bring in. And storytelling is the foundation of everything. You're studied storytelling in your blog. You're storytelling when you are writing your, your content. Your story, you can't do anything. I'm sorry, but you can't do anything without a story. <laughs> yeah, you need to lead it on. It is something that I, I probably need to work in more. Um, I tend to just get on with my, I mean, in my, in my private stuff that I do, it's all technical. So it's just like jumping, we create this. Usually, sometimes there's a story behind it. Like I might have been asked to do it by a client or um, this idea might have come along from watching a film or these sort of things. So in that, in that scenario, I do try and turn it into a bit of a story. But it is something that I could utilize a lot more, I think, and have such, you know, such a more powerful response uh, from these things. 
You can do it. So I used to sell security cameras. So there you go. And if I can make a security camera have a story, anyone can make anything have a story. I used to do, I, I taught about processes and I taught storytelling to sell processes. So you can turn anything into a story. The 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 thing I shared, the Stanislavski seven questions, I it's it was a bit messy today, but if you download the deck, you get that that slide. That slide goes through it really nicely on how to do it. And I've got people out there who still do this for use that format when they're talking about recruitment jobs. I'm really proud. <laughs> wow, that's good. When something sinks and people are downloading it and using it um that's that's good you know you've done a good job yeah so i would honestly say stenosowski seven questions is a great foundation for storytelling yeah i think um oh, we did a branding uh ian hamilton he, he's a branding expert and he did part of a course on the tutorials and uh, he was using uh those seven guides to fill out basically an avatar and all those things so it's amazing how how it can be repurposed those seven things can be repurposed pretty much everything in life in a way, you know? So it, that's a powerful thing to, to land back on. Now I know like you talk, you've, you've spoken a lot today, but, <laughs> and you are where you are now, but it was a journey to get there. And I'm guessing that a lot of people that are watching this are kind of like, well, how, I don't know where to start with that. How do I get to be as confident as that? How do I, how do I, I don't sound right on camera. I've got, I, you know, they might, there could be loads of things. I haven't got the money to get the equipment and things like that. Uh, where do they start? How, what would be the first thing? What would be a gentle approach for them to kind of get into this? Cause I see so many people don't want to be on camera. They do things like these um, doodly animations and things mm -hmm. like that. Just have their voice over. And even the sound on the voice is not particularly good either. Uh, so how would you get into that? What would be your your approach? I oh, say so your phone. Yeah. Pick up your phone. Yeah, pick up your phone. Turn it on. Look at it. Lift it to to about. Oh, just moving the camera to about there. And the reason I'm doing it in portrait because it's a bit easier than landscape. I will explain that in a minute. But have it about there and talk to here. This bit there. So you're not even looking at the lens and just post something. Because you'll look like you're not looking at the camera, but you're not looking away. So you've got a bit of confidence. You'll just about catch yourself. You'll probably start giggling and you'll feel a fool, but start getting used to just talking at the lens. In fact, if you are like I am right now, I can talk directly at my lens and see myself reflected back. So a lot of the time it's just about get, getting used to it. On a point, there is a video on this, but. If you are shooting a landscape, my phone is filthy, you actually want to look here. So I always place my camera with my lens to the left of me and you're actually looking about there, two, about 0.5 centimetres from the lens, just so that people know where to look on landscape. Because on YouTube, landscape was, is still tracking better, but for your social media, you tend to go in portrait. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, especially for things like Instagram and TikTok yeah. and those sort of things for reels. So I know that, you, you know, you've got a lot of subjects. We were talking about which subject to pick. You've given us like a global overview of a lot of things, but it would be good to have you back again, Kirsty, and just to specialise on one little thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know people are going to be pausing this, rewinding, pausing, rewinding. I might have to do a little bit of a chapter. <laughs> This is why I set up because I look at the content. So this people said to me, what do you do? And I got this wrong. And this is another thing. I got it really wrong. I went down the public speaking on camera route. And that's not, actually not what I do. I do video marketing content strategy. So I will look at what you're saying. I will look at your course. So the course that you're doing, I'll make sure that it's presented correct, not present correctly, presented by you. And I think that's really key using your words. We'll get rid of the info words, but using your words and and it's really and, and I'll get you strong and owning your space. So, yeah, it, it's you are right. There was a lot in there. Um, I usually only do a 20 minute talk on social media video or a video for your website. But I wanted to give an over arc because there's, this is a lovely top down level. Look at it. And I'm going to charge people and ask them to start 
putting video up there and, and, and tag me because I promise you I'll give you a decent comment and I will share it in, you know I'll share it on Facebook and I will say look what we're doing I will support you and that's really key because the first point of posting a video is making sure you've got the support and if you get that positive feedback you will do it again perfect right so that's it's coming up two minutes now to one o'clock so generally we run for three hours, but um, Kirsty's come in. So we've run this first session for four hours. So thank you for turning up. Brilliant. No for an extended session. And what I want to do is I want to just show um, Kirsty's website. So you might want to go on there. I know, Kirsty, you've got a freebie on there as well, haven't you? There's three freebies on there. Yeah. So this is your website. So if I scroll yes. down, tell me when to stop. So there's a join my mailing list there, and that's the ultimate guide to presenting on camera, which will give you lots of information, but also talk about the tech. So a bit more, more in depth. And then down here, we have seven steps, which is a quick overview that you should always do before you go on camera. And then the public speaking tips, similar, but slightly different, a bit more in depth, and there will be more coming. And can I do a shout out to the person who designed my website? Because she's in the group. Of course you can. Awesome. Chayla, you rock. This is Chayla Hall. <laughs> yeah, I know, because uh, someone recommended, was that who recommended you to come in and, on a day with Zendler? Yeah. Oh, there you go. So that was a recommendation. That's why Kirsty's in here. I'm so happy that, um, that people are recommending other people to come in here. It's yeah. fabulous. So her link will be put into the chat. Also, I just want to point out that um, Kirsty does have a YouTube challenge, uh, ch challenge channel. <laughs> she's probably got lots of challenges going on, but you can go and check out her videos here. You can see she's got a load of videos and there's a ton of free tips. You know, it's like you can tell when people are passionate about their subjects because you produce free content. It's I do it. I've got hundreds and hundreds of videos of free content that I've done over the years. And uh, you can tell that someone's passionate about what they do by the amount of free content they're giving out. Of course, it's always our thing is to get people in because they want to be talked with you directly. They want to get to know you and engage. And that's where you make your money because you're actually engaging with them or doing something specifically for them. So you do this, but it shows the passion of people. I always look at someone's YouTube channel and I go, oh, that's someone that loves what they do because they wouldn't be producing that much free content if they didn't, that's for sure. And remember, she's reusing it as well. So that is Kirsty, and uh, it's been fabulous. It's been great to meet you, Kirsty. It's been no lovely. Problem. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this ends session one, uh, session one of the day with Zenla. We're back at three o'clock and uh, we've got lots more exciting things to share. So great. Thank you again, all okay. of the people that are on today and Kirsty for finishing with me for this first session. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.